Here. Mr. Tuma, Mr. Tuma absent at the moment. Mr. Hauser. Here. Ms. Baker, Ms. Baker is absent at the moment. Ms. Simon. Here. We have a quorum. Also like the record to reflect that Councilman Miller is also in attendance. Very good. Is there any public comment relating to the, I don't know, we have to say relating. Is there any public comment, period? No, no one has signed in. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, has everybody had a chance to look at the minutes from the June 18th uh, meeting? Uh, the chair will move to approve the minutes. Is there a second? second? It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion regarding June 18th meeting? Hearing none, all in favor of approval of the minutes from June 18th, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the minutes have been approved. Uh, please let the record reflect Ms. Baker's. Ms. Baker is, 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 is here with us. Uh, we are going to reverse the order, um, if that's okay with uh, uh, the county executive's office. Uh, we're going to go from we're going to go three, two, one. Just for anybody uh, reading pleasure, uh, we're going to go um, because I think there's some some other uh, airplane flights in consideration. So let's get started. If you are, are you prepared to go for I am prepared, the third item? Mr. Chairman, okay. yes. Please let's begin. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Council Members. I'm Excuse Michael. Me, Mr. Chair, would you like me to read it into the record? Oh, I apologize. Yes, thank you very right. much. Resolution number 2018-0151, authorizing an economic development fund special large-scale attraction forgivable loan in the amount not to exceed $500,000 to Covia Holdings Corporation for the benefit of the Fairmont Santro Inc. Uniman Corporation merger and headquarters project to be located at 3 Summit Park Drive in the city of Independence. Thank you, and I apologize. In the, in the speed of trying to keep things moving, I forgot to have it read in the record. I appreciate that, Mr. Thanks. Chairman. <laughs> Uh, I'm Michael May, Economic Development Administrator of the Department of Development, and I'm pleased to be here today with you to present a request for funding proposal which represents a key component in the establishment and cementing of a world headquarters in Ohio, specifically Independence, Ohio, and given that location also firmly in Cuyahoga County. Uh, late in November of last year, a pending merger was in the works between two legacy companies, Fairmont Central of Jaga County and Uniman Corporation of New Canaan, Connecticut, a subsidiary of Belgium's SCR Sibelco. Two substantial industry uh, leaders and real heavyweights uh, in the uh, energy, mining, oil and gas exploration and mineral sectors. Uh, the Greater Cleveland Partnership and Team Neo had become involved in the discussions which brought front and center uh, the issue of assuring and solidifying the presence of what would be a major headquarters presence in this region, and again, specifically within Cuyahoga County, and the very real adverse prospect of the new combined entity choosing a location in an entirely different sector of the country. The pending new company was strongly considering out-of-state locations for the headquarters of the combined entities, given that both of the two original companies had significant uh, non-Ohio operations between them, Northeast Ohio was in competition with locations in Connecticut, North Carolina, and Texas. The larger of the two companies, Uniman, uh, was based again in Canaan, uh, owned by a Belgian parent, and the new combined company would have, uh, have a bulk of shares owned by foreign investors. So, ergo, the company could choose uh, to move anywhere. Uh, representatives from the uh, from GCP and the independence of uh, uh, the city of Independence who are here with us today uh, to speak uh, on the project's behalf, uh, and of course Team Neo again, worked aggressively to determine the needs of the pending new entity, whose merger, by the way, has only just taken place in very late May, uh, and what incentives could be brought to bear on the decision makers of this opportunity. Uh, in January and February, a series of meetings took place among, the, uh, among all the affected governments to develop a package of commitments that would solidify the headquarters here. The state of Ohio offered an eight-year job creation tax credit valued at $1.46 million to support the headquarters consolidation. The city of Independence offered a relocation and job creation grant of $500,000. And in March, our administration gave a letter of understanding from the county, uh, which offered a $500,000 um, $500, from its large-scale special headquarters uh, attraction uh, forgivable loan program. Um, pending loan review, obviously, by the CCCIC, our uh, loan review board, and approval by, by council. The package that you will hear detailed today was critical in the new Covia Holdings Corporation, that's the name of the company, deciding to make its home here in this county. I will present to you our still pending crucial role in formalizing this incentivizing piece 
toward capturing and maintaining the significant returns on investment that our part has helped to achieve. Uh, I have uh, with me, uh, as I said, some representatives from uh, from um, Greater Cleveland Partnership, Vince Adamas, and also Jeremy Rowan, who's the Economic Development Director of the City of Independence, uh, and most importantly, uh, executives from the new Covia Holdings Corporation, Brian Richardson, Executive Vice President, uh, and Scott Tincher and Matthew Pollack. Uh, Scott is Director of Taxation, and Matthew is one of their counsel, legal counsel. So um, without further ado, I, uh, and we have the uh, PowerPoint up. Um, is that going to come up here? Great. So as I stated, the, um, the subject at hand is the merger and headquarters for the new Colvia Holdings uh, Corporation. And this, um, I want to give you a uh, sort of an overview and, and then the specifics of uh, not only our assistance uh, or pending assistance, uh, proposed assistance, but the regional county attraction assistance uh, that's taken place by, uh, by a number of government players uh, in, in this process. Uh, just to uh, give you a quick uh, sort of a, a um, um, description of the two uh, players that have merged into the to the uh, final player. Uh, we have Fairmount Central, which is a leading provider of high-performance sand and sand-based products used by oil and gas exploration and production companies to enhance the productivity of their wells. They also provide high-quality products, strong technical leadership, and applications knowledge to end users in the foundry, building products, wa water filtration, glass, and sports and recreation markets. Uh, the company was founded uh, by uh, Bill Conway in 1986 and, uh, in Chesterland and is one of the nation's uh, longest continuously operating mining organizations. They now employ over 1,000 people worldwide. Uniman Corporation is an application-focused minerals company providing material solutions to its customers drawing from the diversified product portfolio and worldwide production capabilities of its parent, SCR Sabelco of Belgium. They're one of the largest producers of quartz propents for oil and natural gas stimulation and recovery and a leading supplier of multi-mineral products to indu industrial customers uh, in glass, construction, ceramics, coatings, polymers, and foundry markets. The company was founded in 1970 and is headquartered uh, in um, New Canaan, Connecticut, employing over 2,400 people. The result of the combined, uh, the combination, the merger, uh, is Covia Holdings Corporation. This is uh, now a new company with uh, an excess of $2 billion in annual revenue. Uh, it, it's now an industry leader built upon two highly complementary legacy organizations that are strongly positioned to meet customers' needs through the broadest array of high-quality products, distinct technical capabilities, and a vast comprehensive production and, dis and distribution uh, network. Um, obviously a major uh, um, combination of two to again, very significant uh, companies in um, uh, in areas of the economy that uh, this county, through its five-year plan, uh, are uh, are very interested in um, in seeing uh, advanced uh, in the way of advanced uh, manufacturing, advanced materials, uh, energy. So, um, what we have, as I said, we had a um, a company that uh, was had a pending merger. Uh, this, this again, began in, in late last year, uh, and th there were decisions being made or having to be made with regard to once this merger took place, where was that, uh, that combined entity uh, going to end up? Uh, as I said, Greater Cleveland Partnership Team, NEO, uh, we, the uh, City of Independence and the State of Ohio, got together and started to, to look at the, um, the kind of uh, uh, tools and wherewithal that we had in the way of incentivizing, and as you, you all know me, I'm not the uh, the greatest proponent of just pure incentivization. Most of what we do is gap financing lending, but we do um, on occasion, and it's based on a program that we developed, um, and I'll run through that a little bit. 
on a program that we developed a few years back uh, called the Large Scale Business Attraction Special Headquarters Forgivable Loan Program, which uh, amounts to the, our way, actually our singular way, to uh, put into uh, packages of, of, uh, of various governments and civic entities to make sure that certain opportunities, whether it's an attraction, mostly attraction in, uh, th thus far that's all it's been, getting companies to come into our county. Uh, but in a, in a major um, um, way, uh, by virtue of world, uh, na na uh, uh, national, or at least regional corporate headquarters. So uh, again, as I stated, uh, we, work with, um, we work within the context of our five-year plan, and we do uh, try to uh, make every attempt to target toward the, uh, the uh, industries that we're, we, we find uh, highest priority for this uh, for this region and the economy, um, and as I said, uh, with this list, it's not all uh, completely exhaustive, but basically uh, these are some of the major ones, and in this case, we had entities that were dealing with advanced energy, advanced manufacturing, and, and advanced materials uh, to uh, at, least, uh, at least that much, uh, if not more. Um, the program is meant, again, to entice, to, uh, to bring in uh, major headquarters presence in Cuyahoga County. Uh, and with that, the kind of top management positions and high salaries uh, and benefits uh, uh, that, that come with that kind of, um, that kind of uh, um, thing, uh, headquarters. Um, and also to do it in the way of partnerships, not doing it alone, uh, doing it in concert with uh, whatever, whatever may uh, come uh, to be involved or, or have interest in this thing, again, whether it's a, a government, whether it's a port authority, whether it's a, a private sector intermediaries, to work in concert with them and sort of put together things, um, dovetail our, our product into uh, what they can uh, bring to bear on, on this kind of, a, of, a, uh, of an opportunity, whether it's tax credit programs uh, uh, or, um, and the like. Uh, as I said, um, just if you just look at the right-hand side, uh, we've uh, many of you have uh, heard us talk about the reorganization and the sort of simplification that we've uh, performed on our various sets of programs and, pro and uh, products. Uh, and the uh, in the last vertical, the business attr attraction incentives. Again, we we wanted to retain this product. Uh, in that it had so far shown to be a, a good one. We have, I have two examples that I can show you that where it, it, it uh, paid off uh, beautifully and, and worked very well according to the specifications and the, uh, and the, uh, 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 the things that we were trying to, uh, to uh, um, um, accrue. Just quickly, and again, you do have a handout in front of you. It's a, a, actually, it starts off with a three-page uh, executive summary of the project, this project itself that actually went out with the, uh, was an attachment to the legislation uh, on first reading, but I, I thought it would be important to provide you with that. And uh, also attached to that are um, some uh, uh, information with regard to what's been out in the media thus far. We have, in fact, been walking through our loan committee and other uh, uh, bodies where public, uh, the public has uh, uh, attended and we've had some media coverage on that thing. But at the very end of the 14-page uh, the document that I gave you is uh, a more uh, full-throated description of the, of the large-scale uh, Special Headquarters Forgivable Loan Program. But here's the, these are the, the, uh, the, uh, the primary key uh, items of, uh, of what drives this program. Uh, we, we, again, are, uh, are looking for a world, national, major, regional headquarters. Uh, we need to see at least 25 positions with salaries, the bare salaries of over $100,000 per year. Uh, we, uh, we give a, uh, a seven-year uh, loan to the entity uh, in exchange for a seven-year commitment to not only create those jobs but stay within Cuyahoga County or there will be penalties and clawbacks. We don't do any more than 25% of what we define as the headquarters uh, project cost. 
Uh, as I stated before, we have to uh, be partnering with other uh, funding uh, um, entities and, and commitments. Um, we have a formula that's, uh, that basically uh, uh, calculates what, uh, how much money could go to this uh, enterprise uh, at a clip of $10,000 for each job uh, created, but we do max out at $500,000 uh, for for this uh, any any one time using this program. We require very solid security and collateral and guarantees on this uh, on this uh, uh, methodology, and we also need to see a return on investment uh, of over two to one for our dollars in, in the way of tax revenues generated. Uh, and at the end, the loan, which uh, actually is uh, uh, the principal and does bear some interest, in this case it'll be 3% per annum, uh, we do have that building, but at the end of uh, year seven, if all commitments have been uh, uh, fulfilled, uh, the job creation, the uh, staying put in, in, uh, in Cuyahoga County, the, uh, the principal and interest are forgiven in whole. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a couple of uh, uh, examples uh, where we use this program. Uh, the first one was, uh, you may remember it, uh, named Sterigenics. Uh, this was back in October of 2016. Uh, they've since changed their name to Cetera Health. Uh, still everything the same, uh, and uh, they were, uh, this was uh, kind of the initial voyage of this program. Uh, we were in the throes of trying to uh, compete with uh, Chicago, Illinois for the headquarters of Sterigenix. Uh, the, the CEO uh, was uh, uh, sort of trying to convince uh, uh, his board of directors that, uh, that the company ought to come to Northeast Ohio, and, uh, and in this case, the I-77 corridor was attractive to them, and we created this program literally to try to meet that need and be uh, be timely and effective in being part of uh, an, a, a package assemblage for the for the uh, securing of, of Sterigenix, uh into town. A uh, just a very cutting edge company in healthcare and uh, and diagnostics. They do sterilization. They do gamma technologies. Uh, they were bringing with them uh, 30 jobs of well over $100,000. Uh, uh, in a annual salary each, and uh, so large payroll, uh, lots of, uh, of uh, uh, again, tax revenue coming out of it, and uh, uh, I think even more importantly, their, their, uh, their headquarters, world headquarters, uh, positing themselves here in, uh, in Cuyahoga County. In this case, it was in the city of uh, Broadview Heights. Um, after that, in April of 2017, we uh, used, again, this product uh, and uh, um, uh, $480,000 uh, in forgivable loan to entice um, and work with Seven Signal to uh, land in uh, independence. Uh, and again, very uh, uh, opportune in terms of uh, a, a IT and software company that is uh, is in the uh, uh, information technology field, but uh, mission critical kind of uh, Wi-Fi applications in hospitals and uh, and uh, universities, um, and some of the products are are indicated there on the on the bottom right hand corner. Um, again, they uh, they moved into in this case City of Independence. Uh, Independence was very instrumental and very uh, participatory in getting uh, uh, putting their. Uh, um, uh, their uh, uh, resources uh, into this package, and again, we had a success uh, with uh, with getting Seven Signal. In this case, they moved from Akron. Uh, they did come into Cuyahoga County and uh, got us uh, an annual payroll of over uh, four million dollars, and again, a great uh, return on investment for uh, for the five hundred thousand or uh, four hundred eighty thousand dollars that we applied in this uh, in this case. So uh, we're now. Uh, in a position where the, the, we have not really entertained, uh, uh, we, uh, we have not had any other examples since then. I mean, again, our bar is very high. Uh, the, um, you know, the, the specifications of the program are, are somewhat daunting. Uh, and uh, because of that, um, we have not had many um, takers or opportunities to sort of uh, to uh, 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 use this program again. Uh, however, this uh, this new merger of uh, Fairmont Central and uh, Uniman uh, into Covia Holdings uh, presented uh, again a, a um, uh, 
an appropriate uh, 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 opportunity that fit this program um, like a glove, and um, and it was our basically feeling that uh, in those in that pivotal time in December, January, February, heading toward what was looking to be a a, a, a merger that was actually going to take place sometime in May or June, that there needed to be. Um, a marshalling of the uh, of uh, uh, the uh, stakeholder uh, cities and, and government entities uh, and and civic stakeholders to get this um, uh, company uh, 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 wedded to uh, and deciding to come here. Uh, and uh, even though we had uh, Fairmont Central uh, uh, in Jaga in Chesterland, uh, the uh, the the dynamics were such that uh, that was no assurance. Uh, making sure that uh, that this thing, once the smoke uh, cleared, that that they'd be uh, they 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 uh, uh, cement themselves here. Um, so we had um, um, a, a series of, as I said, we there were a number of uh, players that came forth with. Uh, with their uh, uh, dollars and, and programs, the City of Independence again came in with five hundred thousand dollars. You'll see in the basically has sources on the right hand side, uses on the left hand side for this this uh, this project. Um, and um, the uh, state of Ohio came in with a one point four six million dollar uh, uh, job creation tax credit over the next. Uh, seven or eight years, um, and uh, landlord contributions. Uh, again, this is all a package that basically amounted to, um, in this case, the landlord was providing up to a million dollars. I think, uh, I actually believe it's turned out to be more than that, but given the costs that, uh, that have been involved in the, uh, in the, in the fix up, the renovations of the space and, and all that. Uh, and here we are at the bottom uh, right hand corner with, with a half a million dollars again calculated by the fact that this, uh, this company is going to be uh, bringing and growing 79 jobs in this location uh, and, and the headquarters uh, um, um, uh, operation. So it did qualify for the max of fifty uh, uh, of five hundred thousand um, dollars, and actually would have qualified for more, but we have a we have a cutoff. Uh, so this is uh, again about a three point seven million dollar project, of which we're a uh, a portion. Uh, but I think that there's strong, obviously, commitment, certainly from the city of Independence, uh, in terms of grant dollars. Um, very impressive. Sort of they they also were, as I said, uh, were involved in Seven Signal and. Uh, Really putting their money where their mouth is uh, in these uh, in these uh, uh, opportunities and episodes. Uh, so, in a nutshell, the um, um, the terms uh, and the amount of the loan is five hundred thousand dollars. Again, as I said, it'll bear an interest uh, rate of uh, three percent per annum. We will uh, have. Priority positions on uh, furnitures, fixture, fixtures, and equipment. Their technical uh, machinery and equipment that their hardware and software that they'll be putting in. Uh, the uh, they are also going to be providing a corporate guarantee uh, for this loan. Uh, and again, to restate the uh, terms of the uh, loan, our principal and interest deferred, uh, which would uh, the balloon owed at year seven, uh, except for the. F for the fulfillment of the jobs creation requirement and the maintain, maintenance of those jobs and the county's pre, or, uh, the company's presence for seven years, uh, the entirety of the loan would be forgiven. Um, it, the location that's been uh, that uh, it was chosen is Three Summit Park Drive in Independence, and uh, again you can see the uh, the, fi the facts and the figures uh, in terms of 79 jobs. 35 of the jobs, which is well over our threshold in terms of we need to see 25, they're immediately producing 35 jobs uh, with salaries of uh, over $100,000. Uh, a very hefty payroll of over $14 million. Uh, uh, it's actually, I, I believe it's about 10 or something uh, right now, but it will grow quickly to $14 million within three years. And we uh, estimate that uh, there will be about uh, $2.7 million in new tax revenue uh, over that course of seven years. So, um, good questions. Yeah, great. So that's, uh, that is uh, the, uh, the proposal. Uh, 
the uh, company is here to uh, speak to you about the uh, uh, position and perspective of the company, and uh, I can ask questions, uh, uh, answer questions right now. On uh, yeah, why don't we uh, why don't we take the, the funding package, the financing, and then we'll hear from the uh, the right. folks from from the corporation uh, at that point in time. Does anybody have any questions in regards to the way the loan package uh, has been laid out and the uh, programs, collateral, stack, cash, dollars, jobs, all those things? Anyone? Hearing no questions, well, then, Cheryl, uh, as you know, more than likely, we'll have, ask a few. Sure. Um, the uh, length of the lease that this is going to be uh, incorporated a, in here, that maybe be a missed 10 -year it. Lease, Mr. Ten year lease. Ten year lease, okay. And, and so this is the loan is going to support for seven of that. Um, in the jobs and uh, you indicate it's $100,000. Is that the net average of the, the no, job? There, or, are, there are literally, uh, those, there are 35 jobs that are uh, going to be, again, varying, but they're all over $100,000. And again, if you divide the 79 jobs into a $14 million payroll, we're talking, uh, uh, you know, a high average, even with the uh, employees that are uh, that are below, oh, sorry below the thirty-five jobs. Of oh, those jobs, how many of them already live in Ohio? Um, I do not know. They can. Uh, I believe the company can tell you that. Okay. Though. Well, if, I, if I they think, could again. It, um, I do know that um, uh, about. Uh, I think it's uh, about forty some jobs will be coming from. Um, from Chesterland, so yeah, so those are Ohio. Uh, okay, so those are just, just came th those forty jobs are not added to the state of Ohio. No, right. not to the state of Ohio, to Cuyahoga County. Okay. So, so those those do they exist in, in Ohio right now? The other jobs will be coming from various spots, mostly from uh, Kane and Well, I know there's three hundred seventy-five thousand dollars allocated here for relocation. So we'll, we'll ask about that because I'd like to, sure. I mean, that's the additive portion of where the state of Ohio benefits because right. I assume that the folks from Team Neo were looking at what's additive to the state of Ohio and right. uh, when, when they put forth their money. So right. I would love to know uh, what the additive aspects of that are. Um, the other one is you alluded a couple times to Seven Signal uh, coming also to Independence However, the difference between Seven Signal and this is that Seven Signal is a software company, and their product is a written code that gets written by the folks at Seven Signal. Yes. This company's product is a manufacturing product. Well, uh, it's what manufacturing as well? I mean, well, services. But what 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 manufacturing portion, if any, is going to come to Cuyahoga County eventually? Uh, that I I can't say what whether manufacturing operations will be coming here. Uh, 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 I know that some exist. They've got, um, and again, I'm not. I haven't plotted all the uh, the plants and uh, um, the uh, terminal operations uh, and so on. But I mean, basically, what we'll have here, and again, I, they can give a profile. I, I, I'm certain of the. You know, we're talking at the end of this thing. We're talking about 50 plants, and we're talking 95 uh, 95 operating terminals, uh, and over 2,000. Uh, Business customers, uh, what the what the location of all that, uh, where all of that is, I can't I can't give you a profile of that right now today. Okay, but the the headquarters is now going to be yes. uh, here in I mean, Cuyahoga County, and I, right? And that's uh, the main and event. will this that's be the building the address for the corporation for this? This will be the building address for the corporation. So yes. uh, under. We have no idea where the Supreme Court decision is going to be on statewide business billing, uh, but they certainly flip the model. And if this becomes the billing address, um, I'd be very interested to know uh, how beneficial that will be yeah. uh, for their billing transactions out there. Um, you indicated that the interest is 3% and it's going to be calculated. Uh, are we retaining the 3% throughout the seven years no. or everything's going to get waived? So, waived. so for, for us to be talking about 3%, it's only if they go into default yeah. uh, on, and, on the and loan. And again, I, I, I guess not, it comes down to, you know, making it hurt a little bit, uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, not just our principal back, but a little, you know, if, if this, if this uh, does not come to fruition uh, and there are problems that, uh, you know, maybe three, four years in they're leaving or whatever, uh, 
I want to get something. Well, well seven-year-old furniture, which is the primary catalog, is well, not hence, worth a whole lot. the interest uh, yeah, uh, yeah. application. Right? Yeah, uh, and I don't know what you said, machinery, uh, technical equipment. I assume we're talking computers or yeah, something correct. like that. Again, correct. seven-year-old computers are... Correct. We don't have a whole lot of of assets to, to back up that right. other I, I, than... I think the, what this would boil down to is a scenario that where earlier on uh, the company, uh, for, for whatever reason, uh, you know, uh, leaves out of here or whatever, and then we've got something. If, if this has gone six years, we've had a good experiment here. I mean, we, you know, things have, have worked yeah. out well. Uh, obviously, everything is, is coming off of the, the income tax off the individuals Correct. that are yes. being paid there is, yes. is, is what the benefit is going to yes. be. Yes. Uh, and you have a f corporate guarantee. Is that the foreign holding corporation or is that the uh, domestic that has corporation? Yet to be determined, but there are several holding corporations that could be, uh, uh, you know, uh, we've got the, the major, major parent and a number of other entities that, uh, again, we're, we're, we need to negotiate that through. We don't, we don't necessarily find um, um, the exact entity for that, but they do, they do understand that there's... Yeah. There I assume the domestic one would be better for us uh, if we, so. as opposed to a foreign... The, the foreign holding company. Yeah, I'll let our lawyers sort of figure out yeah. which, uh, which entity is best to, uh, to latch on to. Okay. Uh, questions? There's all the chairs. Oh, good. We generated some questions. Um, yes. Ms. Miller? Mr. Chairman, just, just a comment. Uh, my, uh, my concern is not about this project, which uh, is, seems to be a very highly desirable project for Cuyahoga County, but uh, the executive has stated a policy, uh, which I support, that, that he wants to uh, create a sustainable economic development loan fund in, in which... Uh, in which the uh, fund is sustained through the repayments and uh, eliminating the need for, uh, for general fund subsidies. And uh, given the fact that, uh, that the county has just lost $27 million in annual revenue because of the Medicaid sales tax policy change, we're going to have to squeeze our... Uh, County operations into a smaller revenue base, and and uh, and his uh, his policy is essential, and uh, and what I'm saying is that if if we are going to have a uh, a sustainable fund, uh, we can't do very many forgivable loans. It, 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 it's got to be small and not often. Right. And and, uh, and when we get into the uh, into the five-year economic development plan discussion later today, I, I think we should talk about whether uh, whether there's some language put in that, that clearly states that policy. And, and y you know, because uh, uh, I think if we... Uh, if we do this on a regular basis, then the sustainable fund will not be achieved. Uh, Mr. Chairman, to the Councilman, I, uh, let me give you a little bit of context, uh, Councilman. Uh, it's important to understand that, number one, we do not do very much of this forgivability at all. And I, 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 I'd actually like to uh, give you a, a broad-based uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, underpinning to this. Uh, I, in fact, I just reported to our uh, Community Improvement Corporation at its annual meeting, and th at the beginning of the government in, in 2011 through 2017, our department, uh, through its economic development lending, did about $48 million of loans. Um, once upon a time, it was the Western Reserve Fund. Uh, it's now the Job Creation Fund. Those activities, those loans, uh, were $48 million worth, and only $3 million of that total, around 6%, a little bit less than 6%, had any forgivable factor at all uh, involved. So it is a tiny uh, portion of our loan portfolio activity, and that continues on to this day. We, uh, as I said, we've only had two of these uh, these instances right now, and this is a third. Uh, I don't believe, because again, our bar is so high that this will be a regular occurrence. Uh, and we, the only other forgivable factor that we have in our lending portfolio or in our product 
uh, lines is the redevelopment and modernization program whereby we are, uh, we are working with developers doing a project that needs to clean up a contaminated building or con a severely contaminated land and we provide a loan for that project, that being part of a, a, a sort of woven into the overall project, and we provide uh, only 25% forgiveness on that loan, that type of loan. And that is simply, it's on a philosophy of basically lending to projects that have their foot in the bucket right now or in a hole and need to be brought to at least a competitive level, and, and you can only do that by providing some kind of subsidy. If you're trying to clean up a bad building a bad, uh, bad uh, contaminated uh, soils uh, and a site, uh, we believe and have uh, been working with over the last five years to do that very thing. Those are the only two instances and the only two products where we're doing forgiveness. Hence the, the amount of money. And I will say again, Lincoln Electric, the very early, the vestiges of the Western Reserve Fund, uh, they got a, a sizable loan of which a uh, uh, million and a half dollars was forgivable which all take, took place. That's all water under the bridge. Uh, and that's half of the $3 million that I just described. So there is precious little forgiveness going on in what we're doing now or even in our, in our last uh, five years of operation. So that should be, I think, in uppermost in sort of uh, um, your minds and how we uh, sort of uh, guide what we're, we're going to do in the future. I think we've got a good balance as it stands right now. Mrs. Baker? Thank you, and um, I think this is a great project. It, um, it, I agree with my, my Councilman Miller that we need to be careful of the uh, forgivable loans, but if the return on investment is there that well exceeds what it is that we're giving, right. that to me seems to be a pretty good deal. Okay. Um, the Chesterland, where 40 jobs are coming from, Right. Uh, you know, that's a pretty big loss for Chesterland, I would think, especially if those 40 jobs are the 100000 or more mm -hmm. um, in income tax. Is Can you give me a little bit about where they're coming from? I, I'd actually, uh, I, I'm actually being prodded a little bit. I, I'm wondering if perhaps, uh, Councilwoman, we could have a company come up and sort of uh, give you a better, uh, okay. um, you know, more knowledgeable sort of response on that. Sure, uh, if, uh, I can wait on that. I can ask another question. Yeah, if you could, yeah, ask another question. We'll pick that up. If it doesn't get answered, then I, I assume the folks from the company are going to anticipate that question is going to come up. Yeah. The, uh, the you competition. You answer it than I can, Mr. Chairman. I didn't hear a lot about the competition. Um, can you give us a little bit more? I think that's more in your your world. What uh, I heard a little bit. I'm not sure. I Five hundred thousand is is what we're giving for a forgivable loan at three percent. Where who else was out there? Who were you competing with? Why did you feel that you needed to go to the max of what it is that we are giving? Well, Councilman, first of all, it comes the formula. Uh, I don't want to say dictates, but it does elicit sort of what we're willing to and able to do. If we're going to get a major get in the way of many jobs, high salaries. It, it, it formulaically that translates to the amount of money that we are willing to, and again, it was very, you know, important for us to cap uh, what we did. Uh, but but they they deserve and and sort of qualified for the maximum. I see. That's and as that and I said, uh, in this case, there was competition for this, you know, the the resulting landing spot of Covia Holdings uh, okay. from all manner of quarter. Uh, the the the. the the uh, connections that these two companies had, you know, throughout the nation and even worldwide, were such that it was incumbent on the uh, on the community to come together and and you know make sure that that we could uh, we could uh, uh, right. sort of capture them here. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, why don't we? Let's, oh, Ms. Simon, do you have a question? Okay. Well, why don't we have some of the representatives from the company come up and 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 answer some of the questions you probably heard coming through. Brian Richardson, thank Just you. Wait, for, wait till you get the mic. Yeah, That's right. My name is Brian Richardson. Thank you for taking the time to uh, to speak with us today. I'll do my best to answer some of the questions that I've heard. If I miss one, please uh, please remind me. Uh, so, Chairman, you asked the question: uh, How many of these positions are already existing, and how many will be additive? So, we've got about uh, 50 positions existing today. So, we'll be adding. Uh, 30 positions or 60% growth, and that is simply what we have projected uh, for the growth of the employee base. We actually w would expect that as the company grows, we will add
add, that will be additive. Uh, the $14 million number is also a targeted number, so not only base salaries and target bonuses, so there is uh, upside to that number because in positive years, uh, there's upside potential in terms of bonus income. Uh, there's also, uh, we are a publicly traded company, and so there's upside income potential for uh, revenue generated through options, restricted units, et cetera. Uh, the, the question around Chesterland and what will happen and what will be the financial impact of Chesterland, Chesterland does not have an income tax, so there actually is uh, no impact to the city of Chesterland as a result of that. Uh, there are some employees who live in communities outside of Chesterland who are currently paying RITA or other, uh, other community income tax agencies, so I don't have this specific information uh, pertaining to that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you also asked about whether or not we would be bringing manufacturing positions into Cuyahoga County. Unfortunately, the answer I'll always ask that. Yeah. I have a bias towards that. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, the answer is no, and it's a, there's a pretty simple reason why. Uh, primarily, first, we, we need to have a mine uh, that, that actually we can operate uh, that, would, that would mine uh, silica. And so I don't believe that there is such a mine inside of Cuyahoga County. And then the, the process manufacturing that goes along with it needs to be adjacent to okay, that's, mine that's, uh, yeah, uh, that's, to be able to, for it to be economically feasible. Okay. So uh, there are no manufacturing jobs out in Chesterland? Or no, in, no okay. there are not. Uh, there are manufacturing jobs in Chardon. Uh, we have a mine that operates in Chardon, and those will remain in Chardon. Ms. Baker? I want to make sure I answered the questions first. Um, yes, I'm just Keep going. Yeah. trying to follow here. The um, thank you for that, sure. and and as I said, it's this is I think a win for all of us. We don't collect all the tax, but it certainly is a win for for independence and and the jobs that are coming. And you know, it's good to see. I'm glad to see economic development. Thank you for 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 doing the work that you're doing on this. The um, just looking at the the money here, the renovations. Let's see, the City of Independence and Jobs Ohio, for the most part, is paying for, it looks like, most of the renovations. So that's, that's a nice contribution. Um, the equipment, fixture, and, and, and furniture, of course, there's a depreciation in that, so that's kind of a, kind of a wash. Um, you know, it's 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 an investment that we're making, and we welcome you here. And um, I don't really know what to say as a downside. It looks like uh, we've got a a winner of a um, of a find, and I appreciate the economic development pursuing it. And you know, unless there's something I don't see here, I'm oh, glad to see obviously, it. From, the, from the county sure. standpoint, we'd be thrilled if all all the new people were coming and living in the county, buying houses sure. in the county, paying real estate taxes in the county, right. uh, all those kind of things. Uh, obviously, that's not going to be uh, for the, I, I, I doubt that will the be District 6 is really nice for them to yeah, live in. I, I doubt it will be a day one. I doubt it will be a day one. However, I do anticipate that the 30-plus employees that we're relocating in, I would expect most of them will choose to live in or around Cuyahoga County because most of them are not from the area and therefore right. will choose to live closer uh, to their workplace than farther away from it. Uh, your, your comment on the, the project in terms of both uses of dollars and sources of dollars, uh, unfortunately, like any renovation or, or home build that any of us have done, uh, I would tell you that our, we're using more dollars than we've actually received, so we have outspent a bit on this project, and the company is picking up the incremental cost uh, related to that. But, but I will tell you candidly that uh, you know, this, this contribution from the, co uh, from the county, from the city, and from the state was absolutely instrumental in us influencing the board of directors of these two companies to allow this corporation to maintain its headquarters presence in Northeast Ohio. Uh, we had competitive bids from Houston and from Charlotte and from New Canaan. And I think that the cumulative package that was offered and that GCP and Team Neo came together to help us uh, to work with those three bodies to find this kind of resource allocation uh, was, was absolutely impactful and allowed for us to make a very strong case uh, to the boards of directors of both companies for why they should consider placement here. So the stack is going to go above 3.7? Is that what you're saying? Uh, in terms of our uh, what we're spending? Yeah, the total stack? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the one question that I asked about, it says corporate guarantee is part of our security because I'm, I'm not convinced that furniture seven years from now is yeah. going to be, well, or next technology. So the only one that really has value of three years, it looks like, is is going to be the corporate guarantee in the event that some there yeah. should be an so, oops. 
So I, I'm neither a banker nor a lawyer, but we could, uh, we, we definitely, I'm, I'm sure, can strike a, a, a deal that the county would feel satisfied with where the corporation guarantees it. Uh, it would be Covia Holdings that is the guarantor on that product okay. uh, because while there is a, uh, a heavy investor from a foreign body, they are in fact an investor uh, just like every other. And so while certainly we wouldn't attach a normal shareholder to a debt obligation like this, you'd attach the company. Right. And so it would be Covia Holdings. So it's a domestic domestic, domestic guarantor. That's right. Okay. Great. That's okay. right. Okay. Yes, Ms. Simon? Thank you. So where are the 30 jobs? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear coming from. You said you're adding jobs. From yeah, so, it, so it's a mix. We've uh, there, There's currently uh, a very large employee population in Connecticut. Uh, there's a former Fairmount office that is based in Michigan that will be closing. Uh, so I think both of those offices will be bringing people uh, to the Cleveland area. Uh, we also have significant presence in both Texas and in North Carolina. And so as we reevaluate where positions should be, as we as you shut down one headquarters facility and then in, you know move those people into various uh, locations, we'll be bringing those people from uh, mostly from Connecticut, Michigan, and uh, and Texas. And so, what types of jobs will they be fulfilling? Uh, it's a wide range. So, uh, I, standing here today, I would tell you that we know for certain we will be bringing uh, multiple corporate counsel uh, into the office. Here, we'll be bringing a, a senior level HR. Uh, team out of uh, Connecticut to the Cleveland area. Uh, there are uh, the CFO for the organization is relocating from Connecticut to Cleveland uh, as um, kind of as we speak. Um, I don't know, sir, whether he's moving to Cuyahoga County or not, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, but I do know that uh, that he's relocating from Connecticut to here. Uh, so again, it's it's really those types of jobs. Uh, I would say the the bulk of them are are senior professional level uh, roles and or executive level roles. In terms of your products, it's um, sand-based um, products used for oil and gas exploration. So it's in it's yeah it's for it's for both. So about half of our business is in oil and gas and energy, and so we we mine and refine high purity silica sand, which is then coated uh, and sold into the energy markets uh, for use mostly mm -hmm. down well to keep those uh, those wells open and allow the the natural gas or or oil to come to the surface. And then half of our business is selling into the industrial sector. So we sell sand into glass, uh, into foundry. So General Motors and, and companies like that are big uh, purchasers of our product. Uh, golf courses, recre other recreational uses, uh, and things like, th things like that. I see. OK, thank you. Sure. Maybe uh, we went into our solar panels that we just installed, hopefully, the glass. Uh, maybe. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Any other questions? Hearing none, uh, is there any uh, any other matters? This this is currently scheduled for three readings. Is there any other? Uh, I assume that somebody's taking the microphone for a reason. Uh, uh, yes, uh, and that <laughs> is that uh, uh, we actually would uh, respectfully request that uh, this uh, matter go uh, under suspension of the rules for second reading and that we have uh, uh, um, recess coming. Uh, I, I'm not sure if that... Uh, if that um, um, impinges on us, but I, I think uh, again the uh, where are we on the rest of the loan and the package and and uh, the renovation and all this? What's what's the timeline of that? Well, they're 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 still going on right now, and again, as he, as uh, Brian indicated, the the uh, monies uh, that are being expended, they, there's still uh, a need for reimbursement and uh, and uh, capital. So, what I'm saying is that with an extra two weeks. Um, I, I'm just uh, a little nervous that this, I don't know if this would uh, uh, sort of enter into uh, summer recess. I uh, haven't really been able to look at the calendar. I, I think that there is a, you know, a, a uh, um, uh, you know, a, a, if not a requirement, certainly a desire to uh, see if we can not only get this under second reading, but also effectuate then the, the legal negotiations that we have to get to as, as That's as your part, that, uh, our part. Yeah, our part right. is just to pass the legislation. No, so, right, uh, we have another two weeks or three weeks. Jobs Ohio is on board already with their money on, to, on board. Uh, and Yes. And the legislation is already passed through the city of Independence? Right. Okay, so we're the, we're the, we're the last piece of legislation right. that we're, we're saying that, that is not. Okay, behind. well then I'll, right. I'll move uh, for second read suspension uh, for passage of the next next meeting because I know we do have a break. We only have one meeting in August. A second. It's been moved and second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Hearing no opposed, uh, the, the motion will be carried forward to second reading suspension for the next full board meeting. Very good. Council Thank meeting. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not board, Thank council. You, Thanks, Steve. Got a different hat on. Um, Thank you. Good luck. Hope they all move to Cuyahoga County. We need the taxes. Uh, the second item, we're going in reverse direction, so item number two. Resolution number 2018-0138, authorizing a sole source contract with Fund for Our Economic Future as fiscal agent for a collaborative of public-private funders in the amount not to exceed $1 million to support employment of, of county residents in up to three industry sectors in Cuyahoga County for the period 724-2018 to 1231-2021. Okay, and we will welcome the county executive. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of council, I'm pleased to bring uh, this significant workforce strategy uh, to council today. Uh, as we're all aware, when our charter was created, economic growth was put front and center. That means jobs, jobs leading to careers. And we've been working together over the last several years to create and implement a number of programs that have enabled us to make good progress. Workforce issues are the most significant barriers to business and job growth. We have a serious disconnect. There are thousands of good jobs open right now, good paying jobs, jobs that don't need advanced degrees, but employers tell us that they can't find enough qualified employees to fill those jobs. And then we have thousands of people who are unemployed or underemployed who want to work and get on a career path, but they can't qualify for the jobs that are out there. Fixing this problem is critical to our region's future success. This is not to say that there aren't lots of good training programs available. As you know, there surely are. And there's lots of money being spent on job training programs. The county, the city of Cleveland, Ohio Means Jobs, and the Workforce Board, United Way, the Greater Cleveland Partnership, and Team NEO, the foundations, and others have been spending lots of money on workforce programs. But it's not been coordinated, and that lack of coordination has reduced the effectiveness of all of our efforts. So almost two years ago, we invited the primary funders of workforce programs to come together and to see if we might coordinate our efforts to bring more success to our collective efforts. The thought was that by focusing our efforts together, we might accomplish a lot more than by continuing our own independent and disparate efforts. I want to take a moment to thank the county's former chief of staff, Sharon Sobel Jordan, for initiating and leading the effort. The first step was to get buy-in around a common set of principles and goals. That may sound easy, but it, it takes time. Next, we undertook a study to determine the most in-demand jobs now and in the future. The Greater Cleveland Partnership led that effort. And the results showed that the three primary sectors were manufacturing, information technology, and healthcare. These findings reconfirm previous research done by the Workforce Board. Next, a consultant was hired by the funders group to study best practices around the country. I think it's safe to, stay, to say that the study came up with two overall findings. First, there are no silver bullets, no one-size-fits-all solutions. And second, we should look to work through sector partnerships and intermediaries to provide employers with a single point of contact to access talent, incentives, and services. Right now, most employers don't have the time, resources, or expertise to coordinate with the many training providers in the marketplace and to, act, to access the tax credits, wage subsidies, training subsidies, bonding, and other risk mitigation products. This sector partnership and intermediary strategy can help solve these problems. This strategy also supports residents, helping them obtain training needed to get into careers in our key industries. And this is perfectly consistent both with our county's five-year economic development plan, which is currently before you, and with Ohio Means Jobs Local Workforce Plan. A number of the participants in the process are here to speak with you today, and a couple have uh, submitted letters. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Deborah Vesey. Deborah is the President and Chief Operating Officer of the Deaconess Foundation, and she serves as the Chair of the Workforce Funders Group. 
She's been a terrific leader of this entire process, and I want to thank Deborah for her great work. Thank you. And Ashley, did I screw up again? Did I, did I get this read, read in the record? Yeah? Yeah, I, I read it in the record. But we have, we, do you want the substitute read, read also? Could we have a substitute for this piece of legislation and read in? Sorry, I jumped up too fast. No, 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 it's okay. I didn't have the substitute. No, I don't have to read it into the record. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Deborah VC. I'm the president and CEO of Deaconess Foundation, and I serve as the chair of the Workforce Funders Group. This group is comprised of top leadership from Cuyahoga County, the City of Cleveland, Ohio Means Jobs, Greater Cleveland Partnership, Team Neo, Deaconess Foundation, Cleveland Foundation, the Fund for Economic Future, the George Gunn Foundation, and United Way of Greater Cleveland. My goal today is to share with you philanthropy's perspective and commitment to the sector partnerships and intermediaries work, as well as some important background that led the funders group to identify the creation of sector partnerships and intermediaries as a work by, workforce priority for our community. Given the complexity of the workforce development system with its variety of actors, that being employers, government, education and training in nonprofits, and given the predominance of government funding, philanthropy is always striving to identify the right role that adds value and produces impact. Philanthropy is interested in learning what works and what doesn't work in workforce development and investing in effective strategies that result in positive change. Philanthropy also places tremendous value on the power of collaboration. Cleveland is fortunate in that we have a highly collaborative philanthropic community. We have learned firsthand that alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. As such, we in philanthropy are committed to remain at this table with government and business to leverage our individual and collective resources and expertise. Let me just pause and tell you a brief amount, a little bit about Deaconess Foundation. We were formed back in 1997, so we've been around about 20 years. Our first 16 years were spent being a broad-braced uh, grant maker um, across social service agencies. And about four years ago, we decided to reevaluate, assess community needs, and made a decision to focus our efforts. And our mission statement now states the Deaconess Foundation helps people in need to build careers that sustain them and their families. And so that is why Deaconess is very interested in being at the table and chose to take a leadership position in this effort. But an effort to not bury the lead, let me begin by saying that we have learned that sector partnerships are fundamental building blocks of effective regional workforce systems. They have been demonstrated nationally as effective vehicles for creating reliable talent pipelines that address the workforce needs of employers and reduce barriers to employment and career advancement for workers and job seekers. So what is a sector partnership and intermediary? A sector partnership is a dynamic collaboration of a regional group of employers, typically from a particular industry sector or subsector, who convene regularly with relevant providers of education, training, and other support services. With the support of an intermediary, they are able to focus on strategies for responding to their common workforce issues and needs. A sector partnership intermediary is an organization that performs backbone functions to manage, support, and facilitate a sector partnership. Some of those functions include engaging and convening the employers and other partners and stakeholders, developing and sharing data and expertise, coordinating resource development and alignment, coordinating communication both internally and externally about the sector partnership, linking the partnerships back partnerships activities to initiatives and resources of the broader workforce system, including the public system, and managing projects, staff, and budgets related to the partnerships activities. Let me give you an example of a sector partnership. One is the Boston Healthcare Careers Consortium. That is the sector partnership. 
The intermediary that supports that sector partnership is the Boston Private Industry Council, which is a nonprofit organization. The co-chairs are Partners Healthcare and Children's Hospital Boston. This sector partnership was established in 2010 and has grown to more than 50 active member organizations, which include employers, training providers, post-secondary institutions, philanthropy, and the public workforce system. This sector partnership gathers industry intelligence, identifies and addresses system change priorities, serves as the industry voice for healthcare, work, healthcare workforce needs, shares workforce practices, and coordinates existing resources and leverages new resources for training. With these definitions in mind, let's go back to the beginning. As Armin said, back in 2006, he convened a group of top leadership, which is now called the Workforce Funders Group. This group acknowledged that Cuyahoga County has been moving toward a more coordinated systems approach for many years and wanted to continue to build upon that work. The group's work focuses on both businesses and job seekers. As the discussions evolved, the Funders Group identified several priorities, one of which is the desire to find a way to move from separate programmatic efforts to meet uh, current demands of businesses and job seekers to a shared systems level focus on eliminating the supply demand gap for in demand jobs now and in the future in a sustainable way. The group identified sector partnerships and intermediaries as a possible solution and in June 2017 we engaged national consultants with expertise and experience. They reviewed local workforce related data and regional plans, assembled information about best practice models from around the country, and conducted a series of interviews with local stakeholders, including selected employers, business associations, and industry service providers. They produced a final product, a report entitled Developing Sector Partnerships in Cuyahoga County, Findings and Recommendations, which was presented to the Funders Group on January 8, 2018. The report contained five significant conclusions. The first, developing sector partnerships in Cuyahoga County will create the infrastructure for workforce development activities that will support the alignment of effort and investment. Two, when put in a national context, Cuyahoga County is well positioned to create and sustain sector partnerships. The region has committed and engaged funders, including the public workforce system, who are prepared to bring resources to bear. The region also has a number of local organizations positioned to become sector intermediaries, given their knowledge of key industry sectors and relationships with major employers. Third, the three industry sectors in Cuyahoga County that are fundamental to the region's economic development strategy are manufacturing, healthcare, and information technology. Fourth, what is now required for effective implementation is to create a shared understanding of the key elements of nationally recognized best practices related to sector partnerships and intermediaries, to establish clear and transparent roles, processes, and systems through which to allocate funding for sector partnership develop, development and management in a manner that embodies rigorous and data-driven accountability for results, to specify the financial commitment of the participating funders in light of realistic budget projections for the sector partnerships, and to identify the intermediaries in each target industry sector who will lead the work. The funders group unanimous, unanimously accepted the report's findings and immediately went to work in February 2018. Here's a summary of the work that has been accomplished to date. First, the funders group engaged two consultants as partners to assist with implementation. The first is Chaz Withers, CEO, and Karen Banev, Senior Vice President from Dixon Eaton. They were engaged to help us create a comprehensive communication strategy to recommend positioning and messaging and a potential branding and naming. And secondly, we hired Caroline Tache. She's President of Kirtland Consulting, and she serves to help the group oversee the implementation of this work. Secondly, a three-year, $2.5 million budget for the development and launch of three sector partnerships and intermediaries was developed. We learned from other successful sector partnerships that three years provides the runway needed for intermediaries and employers to evolve and develop a partnership that is best positioned to succeed. Verbal commitments have been, have been obtained for the entire budget. You are here today to consider a request for funding of up to $1 million from Cuyahoga County. The other members of the funders group have committed to the remaining $1.5 million. 
It is important to note that their funding is contingent on approval by County Council of the million dollars. Third, since the funders group is a collaborative and not a legal entity, the Fund for Economic Future has been selected to ask, act as fiscal sponsor. The funders group will continue to be the oversight body for the launch and implementation for the initial three-year period. And then once funding is formally approved by County Council, a letter of interest will be distributed, hopefully in late July, and any and all interested parties will be able to submit an LOI. The LOIs will be reviewed and invitations to submit a proposal for the manufacturing intermediary will be issued in late August. It is the desire of the funders group to have selected and funded the manufacturing intermediary by December 2018, 2018 with healthcare and IT following in early 2019. All three sectors cannot be launched at the same time due to the timing of distributions from the various funders. Let me close by sharing some of what I know for sure from my work as chair. I know that the development and launch of sector partnerships and intermediaries is a systemic effort, not another program or initiative. I know that it will support system change. I know that it will create closer connections with employers through an intermediary organization. I know that it will actively involve employers in developing solutions, which in turn will continue to help create clear career pathways with family sustaining wages for job seekers. I know it will leverage a proven model implemented in other urban areas. And finally, I know that it will target the sectors of manufacturing, healthcare, and IT that are vital to our region. Thank you for your consideration. Mr. Carter, how are, you, how are you planning on doing this? Were you planning on having us ask questions uh, to each individual speaker? Bring them back up, or what would you like? What was your desire in regards to that? talking with staff, uh, Mr. Chairman? What I'd like to do is just have our remaining speakers, uh, two from UH or one from UH, our chairman of our workforce development board and the executive director speak. I've got two short letters from uh, Greater Cleveland Partnership and Team Neo, uh, or though I can either read them quickly or. or and we'll, we'll give them to the clerk, okay. and then she'll um, distribute them. And then that then answer questions, and then I think you'll have the public, private, philanthropic sector perspective, and then we'll be happy to answer any okay. questions. Okay. Uh, Ms. Simon, do you I have just, questions you'd prefer to go? I, I, I just, first of all, there's a request for money. Do we know where, what the source of that money is supposed to be? We don't. That's, that's, that's why I was asking. I mean, whether, I when mean, do you want to get to the questions? This, I'd rather know what's the source of the funding you're looking at before we get into people saying they want this to happen. Sure, I, I thought that was communicated through staff. That's, is, I believe it's levy dollars that where this is being uh, funded out of. HHS dollars, yes. all of it? Yes. A million dollars? Yes. Over a three-year period of time. Over a three-year period, correct. And you've got it reallocated as far as the funding uh, from what, 333 for the first year to 420, it looks like, and reducing for years two and three. Right. Okay. Just one more question, if I can. I'm sorry. Sure. The, no, that's okay. That's why I'm okay. This, this felt a little awkward for me. This be, is, yeah. I would have expected you to, to, to have taken the microphone and given us almost a, just like we had the discussion of the project funding for a project just a minute ago that we would have heard that first and then gone into the support people. But that, because uh, I thought, or, or if, if uh, the county executive was going to stick around, I thought maybe perhaps he was prepared to do that. But it sounds like you're going to get the. You're going you're to get that load uh, out there. So I'll have Mr. Uh, Fireman uh, do it, but go ahead. Uh, oh, no, if you have somebody else that's got, if you want to bring the person up on the funding for, first. This is a funding question. Yeah, this is, yeah. Which is usually what we do. We start with the funding, and then we go into, as you as if you were here before, you heard that's the, that's the, uh, the questions in regards to that. Whoever's going to. Whoever's going to be in charge of the capital stack and what it goes and where it does and who else is on, on the table and things of that nature. Is that what you were looking for, Ms. Simon? Yeah. Well, I assume. it yeah. seems like even more importantly that money's been spent on a consultant, on somebody's salary perhaps. Exactly. Is this, who's funding that part of this? Or are we expected to, to reimburse the work that's already been done before coming to council? Sure. So, uh, David Feinerman, Department of Development. This is um, efforts led by a group of funders. And so all of the work that has been done to date has been funded by that group. What uh, group? I'm sorry. Uh, it's the Workforce Funders Group. It's a group of eight different entities that have come together to plan uh, how to uh, really uh, 
put funding together and measure together efforts so that we have a, a more well-coordinated, more well-functioning uh, collective set of funders. systems in Cuyahoga County. Who are the funders? Uh, so the Deaconess Foundation, Cuyahoga County, Gund, Cleveland uh, Foundation, and others, City of Cleveland. How much has the county already given? Uh, so for workforce intermediaries, we have not given any money. Uh, we have uh, collectively, um, uh, we have invested some, F, some uh, money or, or uh, discussed uh, contributions of money to the consultants that have been brought on in the past. I thought you said we already were one of the funders. We are one of the funders, but again, for intermediaries, we're coming to you at this point to request up to a million dollars to create sector partnership intermediaries. So no money has been allocated, no uh, intermediaries have been created. Well, I think Ms. Simon is asking, if, if we walked away right this second, are we, have we paid anything from the county? Have the taxpayers paid anything in Not regards to this workforce funders group? Not for intermediaries. Have we paid anything was the question. I don't know. I'll have to um, take a look. We, we have not. Okay. We have not paid any money to date. Okay. Simon, you, you Thank look. you. No, that's it. I mean, for now. Okay. You and know. how much money has been paid into the workforce funders intermediary workforce funders group to this point to carry the load to this point? David, if you could repeat it into the microphone, because I, I, I sure. in deference to you having to come back up and take the microphone. You're good. Uh, so what Ms. Vizzi just mentioned was that these uh, other funders have paid money towards the national consultants that were engaged for sector partnership research and intermediary research, and also for the existing consultants for communications and project management for this group. Is any of this money being requested to reimburse somebody for past activities? Not these dollars, no. Is the county being asked in any way, shape, or form to reimburse any of the research, the, de the development dollars of getting the fund uh, work product to this point? Not in this million dollars. So not at this time. Okay. So, okay. Yes, Ms. Baker, we're still on the funding. I, I, I'm not getting a real strong answer, but uh, 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 I'm going to defer to my colleague. But but I feel like you're. The, how you answer in these questions is hedging, like not these dollars, not intermediary. You know, it's just I'm not getting a very clear sense of what's going on to, to tell you that how it's in the impression I'm getting. It seems like David. it's not for this, but it's for that or it's not. I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling like there's a lot of straight talk going on about this money, but that's just the impression I'm getting. Uh, David, I'm would you like me to? Try to respond? Please. Sure. Um, and just yeah, restate your name only because it's not. <laughs> yeah, uh, my name is Deborah Vesey, yeah. President and CEO of Deaconess Foundation and Chair of the Workforce, Cuyahoga County Workforce Funders Group. The monies that have spent, been spent to date, which include consulting fees to the national consultants from last year's work and the consultants that we are currently working with, Dixon Eaton and Caroline Tache. All of those funds that have been expended for those individuals, none of it has come from county funds. The million dollars that's being requested today is for the work to launch the sector partnerships and intermediaries in that particular budget. So Greater Cleveland Partnership um, and the funders put together the money that's currently being paid for the consultants that we're currently working with now. And how much was that, Ms. Vesey? Uh, the... Um, the amount that we've paid so far to Ms. Tache, I believe, is about $38,000. And the amount that we will be paying to Dixon Eaton uh, is in the range. I think it goes up to $35,000. OK, and that came from my, the sources you talked about, the Greater GCP Cleveland and? partnership and some of the funders around the table. OK, and uh, there's no salary or benefits going to any any staff to, to carry no. this project? No, the 
all of us around the table in the Workforce Funders Group, it's all, we're volunteering our time. Okay. Uh, yeah, Ms. Baker, it was next. Follow up with no. this? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, a couple things. One is the um, HH levy that we're taking 100% of the funds from. I don't remember when we were on that campaign that we were talking about a fund for our economic future being part of that that a million dollars out of that health and human service levy is considerable. So how do you, what rationale do you have to justify taking it out of that fund given the enormous amount of services that are needed uh, and how do our other agencies um, react to those funds being taken out? David Merriman, Cuyahoga County Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, Councilwoman, I'd like to answer the question about using health and human service levy funds for this purpose. Health and human service levy dollars are used in workforce efforts. This is consistent with that. Every year, health and human service levy dollars are used to help manage the county's internship program, as an example. Uh, those dollars fund the administration of Youth Opportunities Unlimited because mostly uh, the, the, the funding that we receive for that large program is TANF dollars and it has very limited uh, administrative uh, right. uses. And mm -hmm. so our dollars leverage other funding sources to develop programs that help place residents of Cleveland, of Cuyahoga County into jobs. And from our perspective, this is consistent with that. These dollars are currently available. They're in the budget for the, the county's project and we would use them for this purpose. It's approximately $300,000 a year. It's not a million dollars uh, per year. Yeah, and it's mm -hmm. spread out over the year, over the three years. So if I'm understanding you, the 333,000 a year equaling to a million that perhaps before this program came to us and you might have put into other programs, you feel that this program is better than anything else that you may have invested in? Uh, to the council, and we've always discussed using the, the dollars that are in the workforce budget from the human service levy for the purpose of organizing efforts. That's, that has always been a commitment of ours. And the, the sector partnership proposal that we're bringing forward and the partnership that exists between us and the foundations is uh, what we think something that took time to develop. And so this is, I think, the first time we're presenting it to you, but we're presenting it here today with our, our, our foundation and our other aligned system partners. So this is, uh, this is, I think, the start of the discussion so that you understand what we're proposing and how we intend to use the funds. And if I may, so your, um, your interaction with the Economic Development Committee, those that are there that are primary purpose is to bring jobs like the one we just had before here, expand for those businesses that want to do that, um, entrepreneurs that want to start new businesses. This is in addition to what it is that their mission is to do, and do you see that you have an overlap, or um, how do you find yourself working with that partner? So uh, the, the partners that have come together around this, be it the public entities such as Ohio Means Jobs, the city of Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, or the nonprofits, as well as the groups like Greater Cleveland Partnership, I think we've all recognized that as a community, we have to work as, as a unified and coordinated effort. This, that we have to start to approach area businesses as the networks that many of them are, and I think what we've identified are three that are specifically important to us in terms of healthcare, it, manufacturing, and information technology. So we, I think what we've recognized is they are valuable to us, and their value is, is beyond their tax base, but most importantly, from a human service perspective, they're the major employers of this community. They are many of the groups that we think are driving our economy, and our clients, our residents, are being placed into them as we speak. What we need to do is more of that. We need to place more residents in hospitals as employees. We need to place more residents in manufacturing. Part of what we're looking for, though, is we're looking for the assistance of these sector partnerships to organize that space and to organize the, the employers so that we're not each individually, um, either as a department or as a nonprofit, in engaging them, bombarding them with requests for placements. Right. We, we recognize how that must be taxing, and it would be better for us to speak with one voice to say, what are your needs? because we have thousands of residents that we'd like to place. 
And, and so this is, this is in, in our opinion, a, a, a core workforce activity. And uh, we're, we're absolutely committed to helping as many of our residents and our clients get placed in these great, these great employment opportunities. Just one last question. Is your um, criteria, I mean, what, what criteria do you have? Is there an, an income level that is part of this criteria? Is there um, a lack of education that's part of this criteria? What, what residents throughout Cuyahoga County that are looking for jobs uh, what criteria is there that would fit into what you're focusing on to try and employ? So the human service levy does not have a income eligibility criteria. It, it can be used for a person of varying income levels. Okay. Uh, I think this is what part of what makes it so valuable. So a person that's uh, you know exposed to a, a burn can be served through the trauma center at Metro Health or, or life flighted. It's not. It's in, in no way tied to income. We would say that's the same thing for this case. We, we believe that if someone is currently employed making $10 an hour, they're probably ineligible for TANF. Or if they don't have a child, they're going to be ineligible for TANF. They still may have needs. And I, in that situation, we think the human service levy is a key resource to help us support people that may have a small income. They, they may be functionally near poverty, but they may not be living in poverty. But unfortunately, they may be stuck right. because that small income is not helping them uh, move to an education and training program or, more, or, or what we're proposing connect to this great environment of employers that will, that will commit resources to train them and will provide for them a career path. And I think that's part of what we want to explain today is one example is University Hospital. I think they're doing this. They're a great partner. They've established a national model. And, and But we believe that we could be doing much more of this if we were better organized and coordinated. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Miller? Mr. Chairman, to, uh, to Mr. Carroll, is, is the uh, $1 million that we're proposing to put into this, is this uh, coming out of the $3 million that we've already budgeted in the current biennial budget for for workforce development, or would this be a new allocation that's not currently budgeted? Uh, and so, so for the record, I, I know that uh, Councilman Miller, you met David Marabin, and, and not Mr. Carroll. But so, oh, I'm uh, sorry. it's, it's sorry. okay. It's okay. I know. You, I know you're addressing it to me, but uh, I'm, sorry. I'm um, sorry. So yes, this is the money that is currently allocated in our budget for for the uh, workforce efforts. Uh, this is money that is currently there, and it is uh, it is available for this purpose. And. Uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Chairman, this is probably to uh, to Ms. VC. Uh, suppose we carry out this program as as planned, and everyone puts up their money, and and we uh, we implement these three intermediary organizations over the next three years. Once they're up and running, uh, will these intermediaries? be self-sustaining, having their own source of revenue to keep running, or, or will they uh, require uh, continued ongoing funding, and if so, to what extent? We, um, in studying all of the other sector partnerships and intermediaries throughout the country, um, the, they all have a different revenue diversification model for their sustainability. Uh, what we will begin talking with the intermediaries about from day one over the three-year period is our expectations of what we think that needs to look like and giving them examples of what other cities across the country have done, uh, some examples of ways that uh, these sector partnerships and intermediaries can be sustained is through um, fees that they charge. Uh, some begin to do different types of services uh, we always see the employers themselves begin to contribute as members um, and many of the other partners that they bring in, whether it be education and training, whether it be nonprofits and others. Um, they also, because they're working together, uh, have been very successful in gaining and accessing dollars that are already out in the system, but they weren't able, because they were um, not working in a collective fashion, to be able to identify those dollars as well. 
So we've seen them be able to identify other dollars for various kinds of work that they may be doing, say it's a training program, say it's a curriculum development, to bring that in. I will be honest with you and say that you know, it depends on the sector and it depends on the group leading it. Um, in some cities, we've seen that philanthropy remains at the table, albeit in a very uh, reduced way. Um, and um, it, so it, there's no one set answer, but I can tell you definitively that the foundations around the table, Greater Cleveland Partnership, and, uh, and I would assume Cuyahoga County and, and the Workforce Development Board, uh, we would not be coming to you uh, if we did not feel that there was a sustainability plan in year four and beyond. So we will commit to you that we will begin to have those conversations and work with the intermediaries and employers to help them get on that path. Um, and, but I can't tell you today what that may look like. It would be very different for each intermediary. Mr. Chairman, Ms. Vesey, do you think the intermediaries might be able to, uh, to save enough money in their system by in the system by reducing duplication and overlap to, to pay for the cost of their operation? Um, I don't think that the intermediaries have control over the dollars in the system. I think that the dollars that the government and foundations and others allocate to workforce activities will be better aligned and will be used more efficiently. So you could look at that as a savings versus all of us individually making grants and um, not really coordinating and sharing um, having a shared alignment so that we're focusing on the best practices and doing this together. That's really the power of why we're at the table because the alignment of the resources is so critical in workforce development. Um, and so I would hope that that type of collaborative work would continue into the future uh, as these intermediaries grow and evolve and as needs would come up, we could collaboratively say yes or collaboratively say no. Finally, just a comment. If, if there's any system that could benefit from better alignment, it's the workforce development system. So you do have my attention. Thank you. Chair, just one question. On the sure. We're still on funding. We haven't even got to the concept yet. Oh. Let's just remember that. The 1.5 million, did I hear that you said that that was secured for the next three years? It has been verbally committed. Uh, once county council uh, approves the up to million dollars, uh, for example, Deaconess Foundation um, is prepared to take a request. I'm prepared to take a request to my board in August for their consideration. Uh, the other foundations around the table, Deaconess, I'm sorry, uh, Gund, Cleveland, the Fund for Economic Future, they all have their different timelines of when they have board meetings and requests, but they have verbally indicated that they would be doing the same. And that will happen between now and the end of the year. Those verbal requests, and commitments, you feel very confident? Yes, I do. For every 300,000 that we put in each year, 800,000 will have to come from the other collaboratives, and you feel confident that they will sustain? The philanthropic community, um, and including Greater Cleveland Partnership, um, you know, we spent a lot of time, probably the last four months, talking to each other about the budget, agreeing on the budget, and having very honest conversations with each other about what we felt we could do. Uh, because of course this is all in alignment with our individual missions and how we feel our boards will respond to this. Um, so we have all individually been socializing this within our organizations. So I have to trust my colleagues that when they give me a verbal commitment that, that you know, they have done what they need to do to feel comfortable doing that. If I may, I see in the um, resolution that if that does not happen, that it will be proportionally reduced by the county. So if you were in year two not able to get the 800 plus from the collaboratives, that we will proportionately reduce our share, and that's understood? Yes. Uh, Thank you. Just add a point here, uh, Mr. Chairman. No, I'm out of order for a second. This is an important point. So the three uh, sectors that have been identified are sequential. So manufacturing would be first, IT or healthcare. The sequence of that will be determined. But for, if for some reason the uh, philanthropic partners don't step up, then we will scale back 
the number of partnerships that we invest in. So it's just a practical reality. So we have the ambition for all three, given the research has shown these are the in-demand industries that we should be focused on. But if that's not the case, then it'll be scaled accordingly. Just the specifics on that. The Please stay on the is, record. Sorry, Roger. Sorry. Uh, it's okay. This is David Feinerman. Um, uh, just the specifics on that. The county is uh, asking for an allocation of up to $1 million for up to three partnerships. So for the first partnership, 40% of the total ask is up to $1,045,000, which we would put up 40% and the philanthropic funders 60%. The county will invest zero if the 60% is not uh, uh, organized and uh, distributed by these other funders. Okay. So, uh, where's that? You're, you're, you're telling us stuff that we don't have access to. So, we'd like to. We're, uh, obviously, at this point in time, this is not going to get voted out of committee. So, let's not let's not set up any expectation. To anybody in the room, that this is going to get voted out of committee today. Uh, so uh, I, I don't believe that I'm going to have support on this committee to get this voted out. We're getting too much information uh, at first blush. Yeah, uh, and Mr. Uh, Hauser, do you have a question? I do. Or just a quick comment to echo your point. I don't. Uh, I would love to see the like actual plan and and writing. And and I also want to make a comment. Even as like an organization as a whole, as Cowell County. So we we have a, a company coming from Chesterfield to Cowell County. We basically just gave them a half a million dollar forgivable loans. Um, I, you know, I'm all for helping our residents find employment. I, I'm not sure who are at these negotiation negotiating tables, but I think we can be more strategic. I mean, they get to bring their own their own people. They might or they might not live in Cowell County yet. We we, we want to take a million dollars from our health and human service levy that can go to to service and resources here. In, in the county. So I, I just, I mean, I'm all for helping our residents find employment. I think we have to be more strategic than just um, taking money from levies. And and um, so I would love to see the actual plan, though, in writing if yeah. someone has. For all intents and purposes, this is a forgivable loan, also. Yeah. Whatever, to whatever extent, whatever amount of dollars go forward, it's going to be a forgivable loan. Um, it's just going to roll in over a three year period of time, just exactly like what Mr. Hauser was, was talking about. Now, I hopefully this will the, the the vision is it's going to reap all kinds of uh, multiple benefits way beyond that. Um, my questions are, um, I have no problem with the concept. Let's we'll put that on the record first. Uh, uh, the, the the concept of growing jobs and creating jobs and identifying it. Uh, we can talk about sectors, but that's a separate conversation. My question is: Is that if we were to ask the voters? who voted to pass the health and human service levy that we are going to take a million dollars and use it for this purpose. Do you think that they understood that when they voted for the levy, that we are going to use money for workforce to go out and develop sector partnerships with uh, uh, the Fund for Equinite Future, with GCP? Uh, I, I can't believe, I, I don't recall ever that being a pitch to the voters out there. And they, unless, if you can point out to me where we show that in literature or we show that any place out there, Mr. Merriman, I would, uh, I will uh, back off on my question. But uh, I, I, I don't recall that being a selling message. Uh, David Merriman, Health and Human Services. Uh, happy to l show in the past how we've, we've referenced workforce as a core component of the human service levy. It's something we've talked about year after year especially in the summer jobs program, which uh, you know, we've recast as an internship program. And, and, you know, and this, this is not just in job and family services. This is something that we do through the Family and Children First Collaborative. We've done, we've done internships across the board, and unfortunately what we're recognizing is we're working at a level of scale that is really dependent on us finding the right people at the right time and we need much better organization. So this is something that we do uh, throughout Health and Human Services. We, we, we've, I think, well established that workforce is, is a, a core component of, of I, I'm sorry, but I have a hard time equating um, family first, uh, summer internship programs with somebody going out for an IT job at $100,000 we just heard about. So I'm, I'm, I just have a hard time putting those into the same, same basket of conversation. If you're telling me that we were suggesting that our workforce message was going to go out to the IT sector, which we just heard 
presentations about Seven Signal. We just heard presentations about IT jobs coming here in that $100,000 category. I just don't know that that was what I heard our message being sent on the Health and Human Services. That's, uh, if you can show me that that's the messaging we were doing, then that's fine. But I think that we need to be cautious. This is, to me, this is this this clearly, uh, if it's coming to this Economic Development Committee, it should be coming out of the Economic Development Department, not out of Health and Human Services. That, if, if this is a Health and Human Services issue, it should be sitting over one of these other committee members on that, at least my personal belief. I, I'm thrilled it's here because I love economic development. That should be the funding source. That should be where we're seeing this money coming from. Uh, if it's not important enough for it to be coming out of out of that, then we should be having a different conversation. Uh, but okay. it should be important enough that it comes out of the county executive's economic development budget, not out of Health and Human Services. So I'm just... Mr. Chairman, Ted uh, and I shouldn't be shouldn't be voicing that or this early in, in the game, but that, that's why I'm having some confusion as to as to this funding and sourcing. Uh, Ted Carter, Economic Development Officer for the uh, county. Um, this funding, there was a, a discussion within the um, administration, provides the flexibility for the reasons that doc, uh, Dr. Merriman, Mr. Merriman talked about. He appreciates the but, promotion. <laughs> but again, <laughs> and his wife. This, this effort, it doesn't come with any pay. You understand that? Uh, huh? okay. It really shows the integration between HHS uh, vertical and the economic development. You know that is one approach to getting residents. So we've got the employer component of this, which is the economic development side of it, the residents uh, side of it, and so you've got this what we call the dual customer approach. And so I can't speak to the ins and outs of the levy funding but we made a determination that this made the most sense, and I think it's consistent with our economic development strategy. So there's no conflict, and ultimately it would be our ambition that the residents would compete downstream, would be able to compete for these jobs that we're bringing, as there's turnover and other things. And so I uh, would just uh, push back gently on the this kind of division of labor between economic development and HHS. Um, the... the um, well, I think we've 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 got some clear airing of of the sources and funding at this point in time. Um, if anybody has any other questions on the funding and sourcing, why don't we move on to the project itself? Yeah. How about we do that? Because uh, I, I don't see this coming out of committee. Okay. In which case, and we also have to we do have to vote on on the five year plan to get that out of committee uh, at this point in time. The only thing I'd ask, Mr. Chairman, is let Mr. Feynman finish talking about the kind of the the concept, but also the the intent of having. These were less letters of support from Team Neo and GCP, but really to talk about the benefit to those two, uh, to the private sector. So we have a representative from the private sector that would be the beneficiary. So I'd like to have you, the committee, hear from them. About That's great. I, I have no problem going into the policy, the program itself. Let's okay. let's hear the program. We we obviously we have a, a little bit of. Uh, of uh, communication issue over the funding, so we'll we'll just put that on the okay, back burner. Let's stay with the quality of the program itself, um, and from that nature. And can I ask a qu uh, just a uh, housekeeping thing? We do have to get the five-year economic development plan voted out because it's got to get over to council for a vote. Uh, and pardon. I also have an amendment. That yeah, we have and we have an amendment for that. Maybe What's everybody's time? Could could we get till ten after? Could everybody give us till five till ten after tonight? Uh, could your and after could, what? Sure. After <laughs> <laughs> See, I didn't ask that, <laughs> and I didn't even give you the date. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Chairman, given the importance, at least from our perspective, of this legislation and our partners that are here, uh, my written testimony, I think, answers many of the questions that were asked at the last hearing. I can welcome to meet with individuals privately, stay as long as it takes, but uh, getting this at least kind of the baseline questions answered and understanding around what we're doing, not only from the county's perspective, but from our workforce board, as well as our private sector representatives. And so whatever it, may, whatever it takes. To okay, kind of I, I don't think that. the five-year plan will take a lot of conversation. There's a, an amendment, which I, I think is, is would be supported by everybody here, I believe, on that. So that, that should be short and sweet, I hope. Uh, time always has a way of filling the level of the vacuum. And so it uh, will we'll, we'll go pretty quick, I think, at that point. Uh, Ashley, I didn't ask you. Can you stay a few minutes? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and council, can you stay? Okay, thank you. Yes. David Feinerman, Department of Development again. Uh, I'll be uh, brief talking about some of the mechanics. So as Ms. Vizi mentioned, uh, this is not another program. This is uh, not intended to duplicate anything. What this is, is better coordination amongst all of the partners and actors in the community 
for reduced duplication and reduced fragmentation. As an employer, there are many, many organizations to speak to when you're looking to access talent or funding or tax credits or risk mitigation uh, supports like a certificate of qualification for experience for former offenders or federal bonding for former offenders. There's lots of things that employers can take advantage of in order to hire residents with barriers who are coming through our job and family services system, through our public workforce system, Ohio Means Jobs, through any of the human services agencies. And the challenge is employers have so many places they can go, it's very hard for especially small and medium-sized organizations to dedicate resources, figure out how all of this works, and coordinate this in an effective way, not just for themselves, but for uh, the benefit of their entire industry. That's just from a workforce perspective. Also, industry um, competitiveness. Many uh, employers in these three key industries want to talk about general um, um, issues that are causing competitiveness issues. Funding might be one, workforce might be another, and uh, sometimes these are really uh, one in the same uh, conversation, especially around tax credits for hiring workers. So for example, hiring somebody out of our human services system, uh, these employers can take advantage up to a $9,600 federal tax credit. And many employers are just not doing that. They're just, they're not filing the paperwork to qualify for up to a $9,600 federal tax credit. And so awareness is one and a simple process is another. What we're suggesting here is funding up to a million dollars with the philanthropic partners putting up another one and a half million in three key industries for a convener who can bring employers together, help them understand their needs at the same time, discuss how they, the employers, want to address these issues that are facing them and their industry, and then that convener brings the appropriate resources into that room where the table is to address this in a more uh, efficient manner. So all of the millions of dollars that our public systems are putting up are potentially more efficient if these employers are coordinating and talking together. That's really what we're suggesting. Are there others going to, going to speak on this, or should we go and ask one of the questions? Mr. Carter, how, how, do, you, how do you prefer? Uh, there, you have other people from this. We, we, can, we can just handle everybody who wants to talk on this subject matter and then come back and. So what, well, originally, we were just going to kind of walk through the different components of, of the uh, program. So you've heard from the uh, private sector, the philanthropic sector now, you know, to hear from uh, one of our uh, health care partners. Okay. And we'll be happy to answer any more uh, technical answers. Okay. And um, I was just two things. Just thinking because we did send the council staff, I think, on Thursday, kind of background on this whole effort that kind of framed out. Uh, so hopefully you've had a chance to read that. That will give you kind of some perspective. But uh, Ms. Shelnick, if you're, and she also has the benefit of being on the workforce board and then uh, the workforce development board chair who's also been involved in these, discu in these discussions uh, to an extent. Okay. To provide a perspective. Ms. Shelnick. Good afternoon. I'm Kim Shelnick, and I'm the Vice President of Talent Acquisition and Workforce Planning for University Hospitals. And through a recent strategic plan created by UH, there are key areas where we have a significant supply and demand gap for talent. So to, just to highlight um, the workforce demand that we're dealing with in healthcare, that as many as you, of you know, there's an RN shortage of 3,500 nurses expected by 2020 in Northeast Ohio. Um, just at UH alone, 20% of our RN turnover is leaving Northeast Ohio, which is significant. And so we're losing around 6,000 RNs annually at UH. As many of you also know, one in four new jobs will be in healthcare in the U.S., and high demand healthcare jobs are expected to increase by 15% through 2022. Already in 2018, UH is on target to hire 5,000 new employees, and that's over 1,000 RNs. 
Also, patient volume growth will create additional high demand positions. Besides RNs, we also have severe shortages for nursing assistants, medical assistants, lab, radiology, pharmacy, surgical, and respiratory technicians. Um, most of those positions do require an associate degree or above, but some also require no education. As it relates to the, to the workforce supply, Northeast Ohio working age population is expected to decline by 3% by 2020. Also, traditional and non-traditional healthcare providers in Northeast Ohio are competing within a very shr shrinking talent pool. For example, on a daily basis, I'm dealing with losing RNs and other high demand positions by the competitor giving them three to four dollars more an hour. We're just going back and forth because it's so severe. So UH's commitment to this problem is significant, and we're putting in millions of dollars um, to address it, and we're spending a lot of time to address it by improving retention, creating career ladders so individuals can move up, um, also bridging into other positions and bridging into college. Um, we have increased our education significantly and adding multiple educators so we can hire more new grads as experienced RNs are leaving the region. Um, we are also putting together a value proposition where we are providing better part-time benefit rates, flexible leave policies, maternity, paternity leave, just many different new benefits to keep our nurses and others um, at the bedside taking care of our patients. Um, most importantly, we're enhancing talent pipelines. We're working with multiple nursing schools where we're giving um, loan forgiveness dollars. We are using our RNs to be educators along with faculty to deal with the significant shortage. And we're also coming up with very innovative solutions related to developing new roles, um, like using an EMS worker instead of an RN, and constantly thinking of those innovative ideas. Um, as it relates to supporting a sector partnerships, I do believe in it, and I believe in it strongly, because today we're not at the table with the Cleveland Clinic or at Metro to, to solve some of these severe issues that are gonna be taking care of all of us someday. Um, so we would, so the sector partnerships would assist healthcare in developing more, a more skilled pipeline for high demand and entry level jobs to support underrepresented communities in our neighborhoods. For example, I think it was mentioned that we do have a program that's called Step Up to UH, and it is known nationally, where we are getting funders, the Cleveland Foundation, Deaconess, and others to help us go into the inner city and train individuals um, to go into those entry level positions positions and then giving them pathway coaches to help them move up and it's working. Um, we also need soft skills training and job readiness training for those individuals to go into healthcare because of the complexity. We also need um, focused attention on working with Newbridge to train more in these particular fields and providing additional wraparound services. The turnover is significant in those entry level jobs where we need to provide um, the assistance to provide childcare, et cetera. And our UH mission is to heal, to teach, and discover. And for this type of effort, um, we are already putting so much funding and taking care of our patients and the nursing shortage that I do feel this is an excellent idea to bring everyone together to solve some of these issues. And I sincerely appreciate your time. Thank you. you just before you leave, you said you're putting millions of dollars. How much are you actually putting into the effective partnership as far as dollars from UH? This partnership, nothing. Where our focus is on is putting millions of dollars into working with the nursing schools and hiring educators and doing many other programs to be able to solve um, the higher level position problems where a nurse is a bachelor's degree. We need the sector partnerships to focus on more of the entry level and then also come together to see if there's anything additional we can do for nursing. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Good afternoon. Hi there. My name is Mickey Tubbs, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Fit Technologies. We're an IT managed services company located here in downtown Cleveland in the Idea Center. Uh, we are a 19-year-old company. Uh, we are a female business enterprise, and we have 72 employees. Uh, obviously, we're in this um, space of, of being in an IT sector. And being a growing company, we've grown our staff over 40% over the last five years. 
and we know the many challenges uh, there are in getting um, good experienced uh, technicians and network engineers to be able to continue to um, service our customers. It's been a limit limiter in our growth because we won't take on any engagements unless we have the staff that can provide uh, the expertise in resolving their issues. Uh, I was appointed by Mayor Jackson to serve on the Workforce Board four years ago. Last year I was elected by the board to serve as the board chair for a three-year term. The board is required to have a majority of members representing the business sector. And the chair also must represent business, so I wanted to make sure that um, that point was made here today. Uh, Cuyahoga County, as was mentioned by the county executive and Deborah, created the Workers Funders Group two years ago, and the chair of the Workforce Board has served as a member of the group. So I've been on that group uh, for the last year. Um, I support on behalf of the Workforce Board the proposal to develop sector partnerships in the three key industries we've talked about, information technologies, manufacturing, and healthcare. These are the same um, industries that have been identified in the board's workforce development plan as being key to our economy. Additionally, all employment and training services that are delivered by Ohio Means Jobs, Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, they must be demand driven. So the businesses need to need the workers. This means that our work must align to the needs businesses have for the talented and skilled um, workers. A good sector partnership, which we are missing here, will more efficiently provide the information on the needed skills and credentials in each of these business sectors or industry sectors. Just a, a little bit on the stats. Over the last five years, over 500, close to 500 individuals or about 36% of all the training courses that are contracted by Ohio Means Jobs, Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, occurred in these three um, industries. Um, the largest uh, industry trained for during this period was truck driving, at about 700 receiving training, which is about 54% of the total number. Um, it's also wanted to recognize that truck driving jobs are, are really um, key in the manufacturing sector. The establishment of the sector partnerships in these industries will continuously improve our ability to prepare workers in these key occupations. So the businesses, have, as you've heard over and over, um, as the county executive noted uh, in his conversations with over the 100 businesses, and I know us in our strategic direction when we interviewed businesses, you know, we need prepared workers to be able to come in the workplace. These sector partnerships really help you know, um, provide the collection of uh, needs for each of those sectors so that those training initiatives could happen, just as Kim mentioned. You know, the healthcare industry in general needs uh, lots of workers. And instead of competing with each other, we need to work together to create these um, sector partnerships. Sector partnerships have been sh shown to be effective models to better communicate, and Deborah talked about that in her um, message to the uh, committee. The needs of businesses for skilled workers with those who prepare the workforce. So we're working together with education and the other entities that do the training of the workers. The federal workforce law, the Workforce Innovations and Opportunity Act, known as WIOA, which is the world that um, we work in, specifically acknowledges sector partnerships as a worthy investment. The board's executive committee has authorized $100,000 of investment into the Workforce Connect Sector Partnership Initiative or um, strategy that we're um, presenting today. And more importantly, we're also pledging $200,000 per year for training in the identified industry occupations. It's a very important project. And you know, on behalf of both uh, the Workforce Development Board and as a business entity, you know, we hope that there'll be consideration in order for the county's participation at the million dollar level to help move this forward for our community as a whole. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, to present to you today. Thank you. Was there, was there a third sector on manufacturing? I assume I heard, I heard IT and I heard medical. No, uh, the uh, magnet who wanted to come, they, they could not come today, so we don't have someone speaking to manufacturing, but I think you get the sense of how this would be structured in that regard. Okay, uh, questions in regards to the, the concept at this point? 
we probably ought to anticipate we're going to have another hearing on this before we spend a million dollars of the county's money uh, out there. Um, one question I have, uh, and I'm not sure who's best to able to answer it, whether it's Deborah or yourself, uh, but our single fastest growing area is hospitality. And I don't hear that being discussed in any of these three sectors uh, between our hotels, our restaurants, our theaters, our museums, our uh, all, every study shows that hospitality is our fastest growing sector out there. So why is that not uh, even being discussed here? I'll give you my perspective, but defer to uh, Ms. Vesey. Uh, through the analysis we did and through, as the executive talked about, over the last 10 years, these are the three sectors that have been consistently identified as having a need for a sector partnership. Uh, we have been in discussions in my office with uh, Destination Cleveland about aligning workforce um, assets to support the hospitality sector given uh, the growth that we've seen in it. And so I would say that's still in development, yeah. but it's not one of the sectors that we are promoting as the initial investment for this effort. I guarantee you, go down to the Hilton, they're, they got help wanted signs. You go over here to uh, the Marriott, they got help wanted signs. Every restaurant right below us is all looking for. You go to the museum, you go to the theater, you go, I mean, to, to ignore our fastest growing sector that the people that we just put uh, 200 and what, $240 million into the queue uh, for, uh, which is nothing but hospitality and support jobs that, that are the same jobs that Mr. Merriman was talking about as far as the kind of jobs that bring people out of, uh, out of the area where they're, if they're coming from no job, no experience, they're not going to be a nurse immediately. They're not going to be a CNC machinist. They're not going to be uh, somebody that's running a, uh, an IT shop uh, like Mickey's. They're going to be uh, ac incremental jobs. And if those are the jobs that we're really talking about with the Health and Human Service levy, why is that not being uh, at least uh, being a focus of this county? So I, I throw that out there. I, it's a rhetorical question. If it's not uh, something that uh, makes sense right now, it just seems to me that our fastest growing sector ought to at least be on the table for a conversation. Chair Strawn, if, sure. uh, if we had unlimited funds, we'd love to do many other sectors. We've heard from the uh, finance and the banking sector. We've heard from many other sectors. The, um, you know, the research that was done, uh, both by ourselves, uh, Team Neo's report has indicated that manufacturing, healthcare, and IT are the three most viable and um, uh, sectors for our community. Um, but as was said before, this is about identifying those sectors that have in-demand jobs now and in the future. And it's not just about the jobs, it's about those that will then allow job seekers, both people that are currently in the workforce system and currently that aren't in the workforce system, get along, get into a sector that has defined career pathways to help them not only get a job, because that's what we've been doing for decades, just getting people in jobs but there hasn't been efforts and there isn't a system to help those people once they get into a job, work along a defined pathway, which takes many years into a family sustaining wage. That's the key to getting people out of poverty. The manufacturing sector, the healthcare sector, and the information technology sector have been identified by the experts of which I'm not a researcher to say, these are the three sectors in our economy that can do that and are positioned to do that. So that's why we made the decision to start there. My hope would be that if those sectors are very successful, that there will be interest in bringing others along. But, you know, we, we know how to get people into a minimum wage job. What we haven't done well is to have them then advance along a career pathway. And that takes many different supports, both from the employer and from our community. And um, so that, that's when I think someone said the dual customer approach, that's why that's so important. And that's why we elected those particular sectors. Thank you. Uh, I'm Grace Kilbane, Director of Ohio Means Jobs, Cleveland Cuyahoga County. I would just like to add that, um, of course, we do provide universal services for all jobs and all employers and do work with the hospitality industry, the banking industry. Um, I think the difference between the sector partnership, formal sector partnership, is that it becomes systemic in those industries. Right now, we're very transactional. We met with Tri-C, with the hospitality industry, 
before the RNC when the Hilton was built and um, did the career pathways in those industries and did major recruitments and major training, which is sort of like a sector partnership approach. It was just more transactional. It's not like sitting there. It's not a partnership that you can go to. Um, so those are, those are key jobs, and we do have career pathways in them, um, and particularly for our youth programs where you've got to start someplace. You may not have the skills to go uh, into these higher-level jobs. So uh, we will still be doing that. It's not an either-or thing, um, but we do support uh, developing the partnerships. And those are the industries that have been identified both in our research as well as Team NEO and others as the leading industries for Northeast Ohio. Okay, I just would recognize that Tri-C has gone to the trouble of actually putting a school right there on Public Absolutely. Square around hospitality, and so they, they've probably done some research also out there, yeah. and, and yeah. I assume that they, they're committed to, to those jobs out there too. So, yeah, all right. We with, work with them closely. Yeah, they're great, you know, they, they, like you said, it's not an either or, uh, but it's just shocking that uh, the number one growth area in our county right now is not one of the one of the four. Um, yes, and then ask a question for a future meeting. Just yes, to think we're about. Yes, we'll, I'll work with uh, economic development to, to let's pick another target date and, uh, to, to follow up because I assume that this is going to generate a lot of questions in and of itself. This is the first hearing on this subject matter. A uh, million dollars of of uh, you know, like Ever Dirksen used to say, a million dollars here, a million dollars there. Pretty soon, it's real money, and so it's real money out there to the taxpayers. Actually, used a billion, but that's okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. The um, three point five million. How was that brought? How did you think that three point five million was the number that is going to um, bring this to a successful end? And second to that, and it doesn't have to be answered now. Second to that. Um, I knew I was going to forget this. Let's see. Um, Three point five million. I've forgotten the second half of my question, but go ahead. Maybe I'll think of it. it Why comes, did you come up with the? Oh, do you want to answer wait. now, or do you want to to, want to give you a written reply later on? Oh, got the second part of my question. The savings of the collaborative, because it sounds like we're working in silos. We're working in silos in the nursing industry, in the manufacturing industry, and even in our own county, we seem to be working in silos. As much as we're trying to be collaborative, we find that we still are all working, trying to do the best we can within the resources that we have. So beyond the $3.5 million question as to why that number, how, what kind of savings do you think that our private industries and the county will benefit from because we are not working in silos anymore, that we are actually trying to be more efficient and more successful in the route that you're proposing to us today. And that in, can be answered later. Yeah, in deference to the question, I, th I thought it, the number I heard was 2.5. Okay. 2.5 plus our 1 No, no, million. no, it was 1.5 plus our, plus the one, which I think, is, is that correct a total, for a total of 2.5? Yes. Okay. 2.5 yeah. total. Yeah. yeah. But it's still... A lot, a lot of money, obviously, and yes. and if, if you can answer that at a later time, uh, because we do have an item that has to get passed uh, for the five-year economic development plan. Uh, other questions, Mr. Hauser, did you have? Um, just for future uh, future meeting, I, I would like to know what metrics we're using to to measure the wins of this project. Uh, we give uh, a lot of dollars, and we never see um, the return or how many how many families we're trying to help. How many? Um, um, how many people we're trying to help? Because I think it's great if, if you know, Metro and UH and, and other entities start working together. I'm just, I'm not sure this is the, the best uh, way to do it. So uh, just the metrics uh, that, we're, that we have in place to measure our, our wins for this project would be great. Do, uh, Mr. Carter, we'll have our, our, our team give uh, uh, some questions to bounce back, and then you can go back out to the, uh, all, the, all the participants uh, because... There's no doubt that we want to see economic development. There's no doubt that we want to see these three job categories grow. Uh, there's no doubt that workforce, we, the doubt comes into some of these other uh, techniques and, and, and tools out there. Uh, because we do have 
at least if I understand the request, it is, and it's not to vote on the request, it's just to put it in the sequence of $420,000 a year one, $290,000 in the two subsequent years. Is that the correct numbers that we're looking at? Okay. Um, so the chair will take and move to substitute for purposes of this conversation the uh, substitute that's been proposed. Um, is there a second? for purposes of conversation only. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor of the substitute replacing what's currently before this panel, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the substitute, as the numbers of you have presented, the 420 on year one, assuming it goes through approval uh, out there. Um, and in deference, I really do appreciate anybody who's staying on the five-year plan here. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm sure that all the county employees who are on salary will get paid overtime, I'm sure, right, Mr. Mayor? No, no, just just kidding. I didn't authorize that. Anybody up there in finance, I did not authorize any overtime. Um, so uh, if we can move on to the five-year plan, I think that everything has been distributed to everyone uh, in advance of this. Uh, there has been a suggestion to file an amendment uh, to this issue. It's uh, If we could read it into the record. Uh, the, which is item one uh, out there. Resolution number 2018-0129, adopting the 2018 Economic Development Plan in accordance with section 7.05 of the Cuyahoga County Charter and section 801.01 .01 of the Cuyahoga County Code. One of the good things, uh, Mr. Carter, being the last item on the agenda is it usually goes a lot faster that way. <laughs> so is there, uh, are there any questions in regards to any of the material? And we do greatly, greatly appreciate you sharing and doing the homework behind the scenes of the questions asked. Um, questions, Mr. Miller, I, I think you have some. Rather than go through a presentation, yeah, if fine. you want to go through and ask your questions, and then we're going to uh, put an amendment on from Ms. Simon, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll direct that specifically. So uh, well, let's just stay with what we have at this moment, and then we'll put this, Ms. Simon's uh, amendment on there. First question, uh, is what we have in front of us today any different from, from what was introduced? Did you bring back anything from our last discussion for, for any changes? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Uh, there's two things that I have concern about. Okay. Well, one is that uh, I raised a question at the last meeting that... that uh, in this plan and any of the plans, I, I would like to see there be, be a section, uh, eight or ten bullet points, what are the main things that, that we accomplished in, in the last year and how much of what we had in mind to do did we accomplish? And then uh, anywhere from five to ten bullet points, what are the most significant things we hope to accomplish in the next year? Things that are either significant expansions or new uh, new initiatives that we want to try to accomplish in the next year, and I, because I think, and Mr. Miller did ask for both of those at the last meeting. I'm prepared to answer the the uh, goals for the coming year. The progress from last year uh, is outlined on this sheet on the uh, eight and a half by fourteen report card that we sent uh, last week. Now, Mr. Miller, the way I understand your request is you're looking for a narrative. Uh, do you believe the, that you're suggesting it should be built into the plan, or you want to see it as a response to last year's I, plan? I, I think the uh, I think it should be built into the plan. I'm, I'm, you, you know, you you want to take a plan like this, and and yes, it has a five year time frame, but you also want to be able to to focus on what have we been recently doing and what are we planning to do in the first year of the five years so that we know what the next steps are. So, so I, I would like to see that incorporated into the plan. Okay. Well, the problem for that is that uh, that'll have to be done in the form of an amendment that would be attached before it would ever get voted on the council. So uh, that's the best we can do at this moment in time because we will not hit our deadline. Um, but the, 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 that can be done, clearly. You just won't have a hearing on those five points. So, uh, uh, to, to the director, uh, it's obviously something I can't write, only you can write it. Uh, can, can you bring us something like sure. that for, uh, you, uh, for a possible amendment yes. for final passage? Yes. Okay, there you go. 
Uh, now you both have clarity. There's, a, there's always a real advantage of clarity. He's made the request. He's got the five. Um, that'll be an amendment that he would be presenting to the council uh, when it comes for a final vote. Uh, second, second, second point, point is that uh, that I would like to see it uh, expressly stated in the plan somewhere that that our policy is is to. Uh, Create a sustainable economic development fund from from repayments, so that that our future goal is is to be able to do this without general fund subsidies. And that came up at the previous meetings too. Yes, I I uh, I just had a conversation with the executive uh, about a week ago. He said that. Uh, that is his policy. He strongly believes in it, and, and uh, I think it's important enough that uh, that it should be stated in the plan. As chair of the committee, um, I will authorize, must bring forward a vote to bring it to full council. Also as chair of the committee, I will, uh, in support of my colleague, if those items are not prepared as an amendment, I will vote against it, which is really contrary to what you want to see here, your chair of the Economic Development Department. So I will ask that you please adhere to those two requests. Okay, the, just so um, I'm clear on expectations and kind of communicate what's going through my head as I listen to the committee's uh, guidance here, is on the first item um, in terms of the priorities, since this is going to be voted on by uh, the committee, we want to have the benefit of uh, reviewing this with the executive, so we will turn it around and get that, whatever the process is for. But and then the second one is really a policy call, and so I think we'd have to structure the plan because remember, this document is not a plan for the Office of Economic Development. It's for the economic development system within the county, with our office being a coordinating mechanism. So I think we just have to write structure it within the plan to reflect that this is a policy that's pertinent to this office, not uh, that impacts our partners if you get the all, Yeah, I get the gist, but all that is being asked, I think, of the second point is that Mr. Miller has raised the concept. We have discussed it many times that having a reoccurring revenue source so that you aren't always being stuck with not having funding uh, it would be a good thing for you, too. The county executive is committed to saying he's in favor of that. All it is is a matter of putting that in writing, that the county is committed to creating a reoccurring revenue source so it, it, it is, uh, is out there. And if you want to one day tap it for, for a, uh, a grant, uh, for, uh, for a loan like that we had today, then that's certainly what you can be doing. But it has to have then, you're going to repay it through some other source eventually. Good. Questions or other comments? Okay, um, Ms. Simon, uh, if you would like to submit this as a form of a motion, and I will second it if you want to read, it, uh, read your amendment. Sure, um, it's before everybody, just quickly, I move to amend the um, plan to include a community wellness development program, program to incent development of high caliber neighborhood and community assets and sectors that may not achieve the generally accepted success metrics of other job creation focused development projects but have an important positive impact on quality of place and community wellness. Okay, and I'll second that. Did you have a chance to read this, uh, Mr. Carter? I'm familiar with it. I okay. didn't read this exact amendment, but Ms. Simon and I talked about it briefly, and I'm familiar with the work that uh, Mr. Surin and, and the team has done. Uh, and this came up about a year ago when mm -hmm. we had about four or five different um, grocery store products in front of us. So. I'm, I'm familiar. Okay, this matter is before us right now as an amendment. Uh, does the county, uh, does the executive's office have a position? Uh, if you're familiar with it, then, then you know the sub and substance of the basis of it. Uh, do you have a, any thoughts or comments in regards to this particular amendment? Uh, I, I don't. I just don't. Good, bad, or indifferent? No, I'm generally supportive um, so, uh, because we, we discussed the need. Uh, for a program like this that not only encompasses grocery stores but has a slightly broader uh, purview. We want to have the benefit of briefing the executive. He has not had a chance to get briefed on Ms. Simon's amendment or where we're at. Other than that, 
um, it's a reasonable. Well, well, he has the luxury of a line item veto if it ever gets yeah. if it gets passed. So if yeah, he wants to strike so it just, uh, out of there, then that that would be his purview with the when the legislation comes before his desk. Uh, any comments or questions in regards to Ms. Simon's amendment? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Chair. This also kind of supports the conversation we were having last at the last session, just about kind of the role of placemaking in our economic development efforts, uh, with, which is which is within the purview of my office. And so we have this joint approach community development, which just would fall under an economic development as well. So, well, and in, in fairness to you, I don't want I don't want you to feel as though when we get legislation up here and we amendment amend it just before it goes to council, that if if it's something you object to, speak out if you've had a chance to look at. It. If it's if it's something you're not comfortable with, and you think the county executive might not support it, we can still vote this out. It can still get stricken uh, at some point along the way with the, of the intent that Ms. Simons. I haven't read, had the benefit of seeing her specific amendment. Okay. I'm familiar with the basis, I think, of the amendment and the work that Mr. Cern and, and the team did. And so, something we support. I just want to make have the benefit of the executive reviewing this. And it's something I think he's even, we've discussed collectively with the council president. So, let's just okay. run that trap with her permission and uh, we'll move forward. So so just quickly, um, this goes under quality of place development in that category, and it just adds a, f a fifth component to that to enable the executive economic um, office to take a look at projects that come in that are related to wellness in the community. And Mr. Chair, I know we've been um, so long in this day, but um, some uh, we've got Roger Sykes from the Board of Health who wanted to take two minutes to oh, tell absolutely. us about no, no, the Euclid I, grocery store. We've already invested this amount of time. Let's invest the... If yeah. I can have... Um, sure, absolutely. Thank you. Is he here? He is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, you win the Patience Award, sir. All right. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Thank you very much for coming, and, and thank you for staying and, and watching, uh, what was it, the, uh, what, the sausage being made? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, thanks for taking the time. So uh, yeah, my, my name is Roger Sykes. I work at the County Board of Health, and I wanted to share just briefly what, what happened over in Euclid, Ohio, around the, the community-based supermarket implementation of, of Simon Supermarket. And that's how I think some of the other requests from other supermarkets emerged, was from that process over in uh, Euclid, Ohio. So from a health perspective, supermarkets are very important, both from a healthy food access perspective, but also a deeper per perspective around access to jobs, tax base, and quality of life in, in neighborhoods. Um, over in Euclid, Ohio, in, in Ward 3, uh, it's at the corner of East 260th and Euclid Avenue. No, exactly where it is. Um, <laughs> there's a big plaza there, and a supermarket was interested in going in there, but they didn't have the funding to, to really make it all pop and uh, to make it all happen. And so uh, the County Board of Health, we were able to work with the store owner and residents in the city of Euclid to put together uh, $775,000 in, in grants and loans to allow this supermarket to be implemented. Um, and notably, the, the process really centered uh, um, participation from residents. So for, for this project, over 570 Euclid residents participated in forums and feedback, feedback sessions directly with the store owner so that the store reflected their priorities and also um, held the store owner accountable um, to, to residents in, in that neighborhood. Um, and the way that the store owner puts it, he, he wouldn't have been able to open this store with, without this funding. And his first year revenues were very strong. He was surprised at how strong they were. And he attributes that in part to this community organizing process that took place as the store was implemented. Um, so just from a County Board of Health perspective, we're very supportive of this type of funding. And we think that it can help to address food desert issues, supermarket access issues in lower income communities across the county. Um, the Euclid project, and I have a kind of in-depth case study, if folks are interested, of step-by-step -step how it happened. Uh, I'll hand this to y'all. You can just give it to, to Ashley, then, and she'll, she'll redistribute it. Is okay. It, is it a whole stack of... Yeah, just, just copies of it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If y'all want to have a look. Um, and then I would note, additionally, in the, the Buckeye neighborhood in Cleveland, where a supermarket left that neighborhood... Um, and through support from local government and community organizations, a full-service supermarket is able to be implemented in that same in that same location. Um, so, Thank you. I'll leave it at that. It's, it's essentially what we did with Dave's supermarket, I believe, isn't it? Is it not? Uh, well, it's got an element. I mean, if that if Dave's would have left, you would have had a food desert in that spot. I, I think, because if 
Dave was the last. Uh, I, I can answer, Mr. Chair. Um, because we didn't have this component to the um, ED plan, Dave's had a t um, partner with another development project and able to get the funding. This would allow, for example, Dave's to have an opportunity to pitch the project independent of being oh, partnered. Oh, gotcha. So, okay. but, but the idea, yes. the, the core concept of what you're trying to do is the same, yeah. just the funding source. It's kind of like what we just had. Yeah. Right. No, Ms. Simon, spot on. The, okay. uh, we, we jumped created some gymnastics for the link 59 because we, we didn't did. have a policy and so we were able to and we didn't want to have a uh, set of precedent of encouraging our grocery store to move from one you know several blocks from one location to another but because it was part of a broader uh, development right. uh, program we and UH just opened their new facility at the corner right next to the yep, link 59 so it was all all good stuff yeah. uh, is there any other questions in regards to uh, the amendment that has been proposed, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor of adding the, uh, adding the amendment to the resolution, uh, say aye. aye. Aye, any opposed? Hearing none. Sorry, the, Mr. Uh, Chair, I heard um, Ms. Simon was the, she, amend, she accepted the amendment first, who was the second? I was the second. Okay. The chair seconded. Sorry about that. Okay, so the legislation has been amended. Um, we now have the five-year uh, economic development plan with amendment uh, as amended and the two requests from uh, Mr. Miller, though they are not attached at this point, they will be submitted as amendments uh, when we get to the full council. Uh, all in favor of moving this out for, I believe we need second reading suspension on this, uh, say aye. aye. Oh, wait a minute, we need to move a motion, sorry. Chair moves, <laughs> second. Uh, all in favor of uh, moving out for second reading suspension, say aye. Aye, any opposed? Thank you very much, and I'm sorry uh, for the extra half an hour, but I think it was worthwhile stuff that we did, did today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Did you have something else to uh, enjoy?